Right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this afternoon's conference for the JRF on the topic of water in an international context. My name is Ian Naismith. I'm a senior research fellow here at IKT, and I'm going to be joined this afternoon by my colleague Ashvini Osakar, who, and between us, we will share the moderating for the event. The event is in two parts with a coffee break in the middle. To start with, we have a series of welcomes of, to, set, to start to set the scene. And then we're going to focus on the North Rhine-Westphalia and the United Kingdom and how climate change is affecting water there, but also how there is collaboration between North Rhine-Westphalia and the uh, UK, which goes back 75 years or more. After the coffee break, we go international, and we're going to hear about India and about Africa. And what I want you to think about, think about how the size of North Rhine-Westphalia is relatively small. The size of the UK is relatively small. If you take the whole of Europe, from Norway down to the Mediterranean, from Spain right across the Ukraine, it all fits into India. And you can take India and you can fit that into Africa many times over. So as the afternoon goes on, we're going to be hearing about the bigger and bigger and bigger issue of climate change. So without further ado, I would like to invite up um, Professor Barton, who is the chair of the JRF, to welcome us and to uh, introduce the day. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Johannes Rau Research Society, I would like to welcome you to this JIF on-site event about water in an international context, climate change in North Rhine-Westphalia, Great Britain, and the Commonwealth. A special welcome goes today to our guests from the UK, from Kenya, Rwanda, and India. And as we have a hybrid uh, conference today, I would also like to welcome all the people behind the computer screens. First of all, uh, let me present the JIF, the Research Society of the Federal State of North Rhine-Westphalia. So research for society, economy, politics is our motto. So. The JIF is the umbrella association of 16 independent non-profit research institutes. With 80 million euros state funding a year, we generate around about 124 million annual turnover. So this is the best ratio of third party to state funding of all research organizations in Germany. We have around about 1,600 employees of which around about 230 try to achieve the PhD level. Our institutes are evaluated by an external agency on a seven year regular cycle. We conduct applied research to face the technological, ecological, economic and societal challenges of our time. The topics of our institutes span a wide range from advanced optoelectronics at the AMO in Aachen. Um, two studies on Turkish-German relationship at the ZFTE in Essen. Nine of our institutes address topics round about the to uh, water. The institutes are the bridge between seven universities in North Rhine-Westphalia and their target groups. All institutes are closely linked to these target groups. Our institutes collaborate under four topics. The first one is citizen infrastructure. So we think about how we can design cities and their infrastructure in view of demographic change and changing demands of the inhabitants. The second one is society and digitalization, which addresses the opportunities and challenges uh, 
which uh, the digital re revolution bring to all areas of our life. And we ask the question, how can individuals and society benefit from that? The third one is industry and environment. So we think about how we can make production, logistics, and mobility sustainable in North Rhine Westphalia. And the fourth is globalization and integration. So we, we, we ask how we can shape the impact of globalization at local and regional level in different parts of the world. All these topics address main challenges in a federal state of Germany. But we do not live on an island. As we all know, climate change does not stop at borders. North Rhine-Westphalia, with 17 million inhabitants, is placed in the heart of Europe. With a strong focus on industry and logistics, it has numerous interactions with the rest of the world. Therefore, the JIF always looks across the borders of our state. The theme of today's JIF on-site event, Water in an International Context, Climate Change in Northern Westphalia, Great Britain and the Commonwealth, is such a cross-border view. As chairman of the JIF, I'm very happy that four quite different JIF institutes jo have joined forces. So we have the IKT, which mainly focuses on underground infrastructure, we have got the FIW, which is working on climate and water research. We have the IDOS, working on international political affairs. And the IWW, which is mainly focusing on drinking water supply. So these four institutes work together on a series of events. Today it's the third edition, for the first time open to the public. Before we start, I would especially like to thank our host, the JIF Institute ICT, for the hospitality and the Ministry of Science and Culture for the, of the Federal State of Northern Westphalia for the financing of this event. Now I wish you all interesting presentations and fruitful discussions with our scientists, and of course all of us a successful fight against the global climate change. Thank you very much. And I'd now like to invite uh, Herr Vanyek, the Managing Director of IKT, to come and welcome us to the day. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, my special pleasure and honor to have you all here at IKT Institute for Underground Infrastructure. Such a, such a nice uh, turnout, and uh, I'm sure there are many, many more people online who are watching this uh, very important conference, uh, which is now very short uh, by the end of this uh, year, a year which we know has been uh, very, very challenging in, in many respects. Uh, we got, uh, when it comes to climate change, the large and very important worldwide conference, which takes place uh, exactly these days, and it's, uh, it's, it's finding its end. So uh, climate change and water are very, very important topics, topics which are also um, of our interest, research interests. We've been, we've been doing research as IKT in this field for many, many years now. Uh, we are, uh, when it comes to underground infrastructure, to sewer infrastructure, the uh, uh, foremost uh, part, um, the leading institute, uh, not only here in North Westphalia, we're proud to be here, of course, but we're, we're, we're also working um, outside of North Westphalia, German wise and of course, on an international level, um, as you will see from the presentations also which, uh, which are coming today. Um, so, great you're here. Looking very much forward to all the presentations. Looking very much forward to discussions. That's the most important thing. We have to talk to each other. We got people from, from many, many different countries. We got people from lots of different faculties here. Let's talk together. Let's find out what we have found out in our research. Let's talk and find out what has to be done in the future. That's why we are here. And I'm looking very much forward to it. Thank you very much. And it gives me pleasure to invite uh, Professor Kinley from the Ministry to come and speak. She has recently taken up the post of Head of Research for the Department um, in the Ministry of Culture and Science. Professor. Hello, everybody. 
dear Professor Barton, dear Mr. Warnick, dear Professor Bossela, ladies and gentlemen. Today's successful scientists simply don't do boundaries. For years, even decades, we as the science and research community got the view that boundaries became more and more irrelevant. Boundaries between disciplines, between applied and fundamental research, between nation states were not helpful at all. So many of us were pretty surprised that morning of 24th June of 2016 when we learned of the Brexit referendum outcome in the United Kingdom. It was hard to believe that the people in Britain had voted in favor of leaving the European Union. On top to, of the political and economic impact, and let's not talk about that today, the science and research communities on each side of the channel were like, now what? Brexit was a game changer, no way about that. A lot of things became more complicated. From the researcher's point of view, one thing was clear. This newly formed gap, the new political and administrative frontier between the United Kingdom and the European Union, must not lead to research communities turning away from each other and partnerships suffering to a retreat into a kind of splendid isolation. Today, we are back on the right track. Combined efforts have managed to prevent a Brexit-induced collapse of cooperation in the science and research, research sector. In North Rhine-Westphalia, too, we have done much to help alleviate the adverse effect of Brexit. F furthermore, we don't challenge the decades of friendship with Britain. Today's event, which we as the Ministry of Culture and Science Northern Westphalia are happily funding, is a small contribution to this context and emphasizes the relevance of exchange. It is also designed to send a message that frontiers and boundaries cannot stop science and research. Partners from the UK and Northern Westphalia are working together to realize today's conference. Here, we are taking up, intensifying and reporting a range of current joint projects and cooperations. Talking about climate change in general and water in particular, it becomes soon clear that this goes beyond UK and Germany, as already mentioned before. With that in mind, we are keen to extend our focus to India, Kenya, the entire African continent and indeed the global level. The JRF is particularly good at overcoming the borders that once existed within the science community. A case in point is the cooperation of research institutes across various disciplines. Four institutions, Professor Barton already mentioned them, worked together and have different perspectives on the topic of water. Earlier events dealing with the subject involved even more institutions. Whether the subject is water, global warming, anything that matter, you always get the best solution when you have several parties looking at the problem from different perspectives, with each putting in their expertise. That is what makes this conference so valuable. And it is a key success factor of JRF in general, when various institutes under the umbrella work together to solve a range of research challenges. I would like to thank the people in JRF for their effort in organizing this event. Thank you very much. Last but not least, I would like to come to another pair of approaches that was seen as opposite of boundary, theory, and practice. From the point of view of applied research, this boundary has now more gaps than ever before. 
the JRF and its institutions were, with their focus on application, show, show that theory and practice are no longer on opposite sides, but need to work hand in hand to resolve real world challenges. Today's conference too centers on hands-on problems. To address them, all stakeholders must work across disciplines to discuss and hopefully resolve them. This addresses both interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity. Dear members of JRF, we often talk about you as a roof for North Rhine-Westphalia's applied research institutions. And whilst this is certainly true, anyone who has ever built a house knows that a roof alone is not an end in itself. It is about what is underneath. And even like ours here today, consistently emphasizes what is also highlighted by the evaluations of the institutions uh, that take place on a regular basis. You mentioned it before. JRF is a highly valued roof for applied research excellence and to exchange and cooperation across boundaries. Ladies and gentlemen, to close, I would like to say some personal words. As some of you might know, I'm the head of the research department at Ministry of Culture and Science, North Rhine Westphalia, for a little more than one month. Before, I was a member of universities and research institutes for nearly 13 years. The last 14 years, uh, I worked as a professor for business informatics at the Dortmund University of Applied Sciences and Arts. There, I was a researcher as well as a member of the rectorate for eight years. First, for research, <laughs> and later on, for digitalization. Given this history, I am familiar with the requirements and challenges of proper applied research. Even as I switched recently into this new role, I will definitely support applied research from the other side of the table. So this is my first JRF event, and I am definitely looking forward to get to know all of you, at least over the time of 90 institutions here in North Rhine-Westphalia. <laughs> so let's work together to take the JRF to the next level. Thank you. Height issues. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Andrea Kenley, for your welcome note and your precious words. Let's work together for boundaryless research. All the best for that. I hope we all will contribute to this. Let us now move on to the first uh, set of panel speakers focusing on uh, climate change in North Rhine Westphalia and uh, UK. As we have separate discussion round for question and answers. Uh, hold on to your questions. We'll uh, get back to you uh, for your online speak uh, online participants also. Uh, having said that, I would like to take the privilege to invite our very first speaker of the day, my colleague from UK, Dr. Ian Nysmith. He's responsible for international projects here at IKT. He chairs not only the UK Society of Transitions Technology, but also Technical and Educational Committee and uh, Severe Rehabilitation Contact group and UK uh, waters and railway companies. Ian will uh, talk today about relations between UK and NRW in his first presentation and then he will uh, focus on climate change in uh, water companies and uh, actions taken towards uh, the challenges. The floor is yours Ian. So, um, when I was asked to speak here, I th it gave me the opportunity to really think about North Rhine-Westphalia and the UK, very dear to me. I have been uh, coming over here for many years now, nearly a decade, and working on developing the relationships with the UK, particularly with the water companies and with the universities. 
So North Rhine-Westphalia and the United Kingdom. We've both got mountains, we've both got low-lying land, we've got rivers. We have a little bit more sea than you do around the outside. And uh, when you look at it, uh, North Rhine-Westphalia is bigger than any of the regions in the United Kingdom. And it is bigger than any one of our large regional water companies. So what goes on here is the equivalent. It's almost the size of Ireland. It's almost the size of Scotland. And it fits into the UK about three, uh, England about three times. So what about the relationship between North Rhine-Westphalia and the UK? Well, the first thing that occurred to me with this, and it's not working, the present, this is not... Ah, that was meant to work. The first thing I was thinking about it was, very sadly, we have lost two important people. We have lost Johannes Rau, your president, and we have lost our queen. But I think they symbolize a relationship between the two countries. I also noted that we've recently celebrated 75 years of North Rhine-Westphalia and its relationship with the United Kingdom. And I think it's important very clearly, as has already been mentioned, UK has left the European Union, but it is important to rebuild the friendships and to continue to do joint projects, partnerships, and to take the same perspectives. And there is this very close bond between our two countries. So when I look at it, let's just think about what that relationship extends to. There are actually 130 cities in North Rhine-Westphalia which are twinned with the United Kingdom. In fact, Bochum is twinned with Sheffield, and we have Professor Tate here today from the University of Sheffield. So this has been developing relationships over many years. I think it's interesting to note that there are about 1,500 British companies are active, economically active within North Rhine-Westphalia, and there are some 400 North Rhine-Westphalian companies which are active in the UK. 20,000 UK citizens live here, and there are some 129,000 employees of British companies who live and work here in North Rhine-Westphalia. And so, it, the reason I mention this, we talk a lot about research here, but one of the purposes of research is to facilitate um, technology development, and technology development as well leads to economic development. So I think we should be clear there are a lot of links between the two. And uh, finally, slightly tongue-in-cheek, being as this is a water event, we do actually have a joint military unit, the only British-German military unit that exists. It is half British, it is half German, and it is, has all the bridging equipment that the British Army and the German Army have so we can work together in crossing rivers. And uh, if you're not aware of it, it's Panzer Bayern, Pioneer Battalion 130, based in Minden. And uh, as you can see, it has been, uh, was very popular as a good uh, photo shoot for a recent visit by our new king uh, with your president. What I also realized was that there's been other develop recent developments at a slightly lower level. We have a British-German association, and this exists to encourage the twinning between the cities, and it encourages the relationships between the UK and Germany. It has small staff in the UK. And Something that has happened in the UK, traditionally, we've had relatively smallish um, municipal authorities. But over the last decade, dec apologies, I've gone the wrong way. Over the last decade or so, we've produced some much larger ones. One of them is the Greater Manchester Combined Authority. Now, Greater Manchester, rather like North Rhine-Westphalia, is a former traditional heartland of industry for the UK and for, obviously, North Rhine-Westphalia and the Ruhr area. Uh, for Germany. And so, actually, there's been a partnership agreement that has been reached between the um, Ruhrverband and the GMCA, the Greater Manchester Combined Authority. And I think that uh, the interesting thing here as well, it's about broadening and intensifying the political, business, educational, 
and civil links. This is all in response to Brexit. By the way, apologies for Brexit. <laughs> I'm, you know. <laughs> uh, but maybe there is some hope that we can um, move forward on this. So this is within North Rhine-Westphalia. I want to just remind you as well, part of my theme here about um, research leading to business, to commerce, etc. cetera. Um, I don't know how much you're aware of Made in Germany, supported by the federal government. It is quite phenomenal how many exhibitions and events across the whole world are, you attend where you find a big stand containing German business. So they came to the UK last year um, to the uh, United Kingdom Society of Trenchless Technologies biannual um, conference and major exhibition. And we had about uh, 20 German uh, companies, some from North Rhine-Westphalia there. And I think what you do need to realize is just how much technology from here is exported in all directions. Last year, Roland Vanyak and I, or earlier this year, we went down to look at a trenches meeting in Malaysia, and there was a Made in Germany stand there with another 20 exhibitors, and their products are going all the way down into Australia, etc. So the sorts of technologies, the sorts of developments that we come up with through the JRF here, have, you know, potentially Germany is the, still a great export nation, and I think it is very important that we are aware of that and the links. Um, what we do at IKT, a lot of what we do is very sort of practically applied research dealing with what municipalities want and uh, need and working with manufacturers. It is about coming up with solutions and for climate change we need a lot of solutions. I think there's a large opportunity for North Rhine-Westphalia within that. But um, what about the UK now, post-Brexit? So a couple of encouraging things. The first one is that from January the 1st next year, the UK is once again officially part of the Horizon Europe research program. It means that we are an associate member. The UK government is putting funds into Horizon Europe, which is then available in the usual shared basis for everybody. Now, we have managed to continue being part of Horizon because whilst we were waiting for this agreement, the British government has helped to do some funding. When we left the EU, the British government had a large pot of research money that was no longer going to the EU funds. So it was continued to use and, and to actually help. So the likes of, of, of Sheffield University and others were able to continue to work on international research. So we're officially back. We haven't left. And another interesting thing, a lot of people in the UK talk about, oh, we've got to get rid of European standards and European rules, and we've got to have British ones. The reality is they can't, because, oops, I've always pressed the wrong button, apologies. It's because European and international standards are completely separate from the EU. So Sen Senlec, who write the EN standards, you're used to seeing D-I-N, DIN-EN, um, it is a separate organization. The UK has never left. So we continue to use EU standards. And what's very good is that national standards leads into EU standards, leads into international standard ISO standards. So we're back in research and we're continuing to use all the standards which then regulate how you develop um, products and ensure quality and performance. Um, but what about some sort of practical aspects of, of why am I standing here in front of you working for IKT in Germany, in the UK? Again, it's not work moving forward. Could you move my slide forward on? I think there's a... Still not moving. <laughs> It'll come in a moment. Um, oh, there we are. I've completely lost it. So, um, what I was going to explain to you is that uh, I'm UK based near Oxford, and we've been developing a relationship with the British water industry and others for some time now. Um, Professor Simon Tate, who is from uh, the University of Sheffield, um, is one of our, also one of our partners. 
So the slide, which will appear in a minute, is going to show you that we are actually together part of a European funded research program. It's called the Collaborate, uh, Collaborative Urban Research Laboratories. And what has happened is using EU funding, um, we brought together seven institutes from around Europe. So Sheffield represents the UK, IKT represents Germany. We have Erewag from Switzerland, the University of Aalborg in Denmark. We've got the University of Acuña down in Spain. And we have Deltares in the Netherlands and INSA in France working together on undertaking research which is l primarily looking at adaptation to climate change in a whole range of practical activities, but particularly relating to the issue that we have. If we go, no, it's going to come in a moment, the next slide. Ah, right, and if you could click it again. Is this is going to work for me now? No. Okay, well, that's where I am and that's where Sheffield is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as and when the slide appears, there will be a slide explaining the consor the, this collaboration, Consortium of Urban Drainage Labs. Um, what we've actually been doing, this is a really interesting aspect of it. This is something we often, oh, that's gone way forward. Um, if we could go back one. Ah, it's working now. Great. Okay. CoUD Labs, Collaborative Urban Drainage. Those are the institutions that have been brought together. And um, we conduct uh, experimentation in our own facilities. But we're not allowed to do it for anybody from our own countries. So we have Dutch coming to Germany here. We have French people going to the United Kingdom. We have Spanish going up to sort of Del Tares. We are, the EU is forcing a, an interesting international collaboration. And it's been particularly useful for us with our relationship with Sheffield. Another example is that at the moment, um, we're doing a research project here on behalf of 10 North Rhine-Westphalian municipalities and Lanoff, which is looking how do we extend the, live, the lives of sewers. Now, Okay, sewers are vitally important for climate change adaptation because if they don't function, they really do exacerbate the issue. And the bottom line is that they should operate as designed. So the exercise we're doing is trying to ensure that the existing networks will respond when you have a heavy rainfall event. But bringing them all together, we've actually got now got 10 UK and Irish sewer network owners involved, five Belgians, seven Australian water agencies and seven Dutch wastewater network owners who've joined into this project. So if I show you in, within the UK, we've got, in fact, it's nine from the UK and we've got Irish water from Ireland, which has stayed in the, e, in the EU, of course, is not part of Brexit. Um, and when we look all together, it means we brought together a whole range of countries. And by the way, uh, Jersey, and the Isle of Man are not part of the UK. They are British Crown dependencies. There's a little bit of France that we still have down here, Jersey, and out in the North Sea. Um, so these are the partners. And as this is a project which is also about, or, or today, about the Commonwealth, I'd just like to show you that literally on the other side of the world from us, uh, we're managing now to bring in um, seven of the water agencies of Australia. And we hope that over the next couple of years as we do this research with them, helping them to understand how they're going to keep their sewers open with, with lining, that we're going to be able to add a, a new element to this. And the final part of my introduction, really, uh, we've talked about the UK, we've talked about the um, and, and North Rhine-Westphalia, is the Commonwealth of Nations. And it's probably significant, really, that today that we are talking about, we've got India, but don't, let's not forget uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, um, a whole slew of countries down through Southeast uh, Asia, down to Australia and New Zealand, large parts of Africa, the Caribbean, the South America, and, and Canada up here. It's a voluntary association. Let's remember that. And together, it covers about one-third of the world's population. 
English is the language which is spoken. And I think the most important thing at the bottom, we promote peace and cooperation, democracy, human rights, rule of law, and improvement of lives. And the improvement of lives is both economic and social development. And essentially, you may occasionally read, countries get thrown out, particularly if it's felt by the rest of the Commonwealth that they are not democratic, and they can then apply to, to, to rejoin. So this is the Commonwealth. I'm very pleased that um, in the second part today, we are going to be talking about, particularly about what is happening with climate change in these areas. So that is my brief introduction. And I then have a short presentation to introduce to you the climate change in the UK. Um, unfortunately, the, the speaker that I had in mind was unable to attend, so I've um, done a short introduction to what is happening in the UK with climate change. First of all, we do need to sort of define what is the UK and what are we talking about. Um, just to be clear, it is very confusing. This is, the, this is Great Britain. These are the British Islands. This is the British Isles, which includes Ireland. And the United Kingdom is the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, this little part here. And then Ireland, of course, is a separate sovereign state, um, but does collaborate quite closely for fairly obvious reasons with the UK. When we look at the UK and water and how it is organized, about 35, 40 years ago, we regionalized water in the UK in public, but now pri public authorities, now private organizations. And this did actually lead in some part to the way in which the Water Framework Directive operates at the catchment level. This was based upon large river catchments. Um, we do need to be aware that sort of politically, legally, and for purposes of administration and regulation, they are treated slightly separately. So we have a separate economic and environmental regulator for water in Northern Ireland. There's a separate one for Scotland. Wales does its own to some extent, but tends to share as well with England. So there are slightly different jurisdictions. And if you're ever looking at the UK, as a place to learn about how we do things, it is worth remembering that you should perhaps think Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, England, a bit like North Rhine-Westphalia, as opposed to Saxony and, and, and other states. Just looking at England, I've picked out the fact that we tend to be well organized in the water sector from the perspective of the owners of the networks under Water UK, and Irish Water is an associate of Water UK, off what is the regulator for economy and the environment agency is dealing with all forms of environmental issues. The focus though at the moment is very much on two things, adaptation to climate change, so resilience, and changing, uh, how, uh, in, uh, trying to avoid changing climate by mitigating particularly the emissions. And the water industry in the UK has been taking a very strong lead in that. If we look at what is going on, there's an, quite a number of issues, and I've taken these from an off what document. So this is the, the economic regulator, what they feel are the key issues affecting water within the United Kingdom. So the first is the rainfall. There are changing patterns it is going to become more difficult to meet demand, and we are seeing, or going to see, more droughts in future. When it comes to drainage, we are already seeing changing patterns. And there's an increased risk of surface water flooding and of sewer flooding. And it's also contributing to the, the problem of sewer overflows, when the sewers re reach capacity and have to overflow and to pollute rivers. Consumption. It is expected that in the UK, it is going to be getting hotter and we are going to need more water. The demand is going to rise. And 
there is already increased comp increasing competition for this. And then the, the discharge. We expect to see in summer lower flows in rivers. That is going to affect water quality. It is going to mean that we're going to have to have more potentially carbon intensive treatment in the UK. Another aspect that's considered is that on the one hand, the rivers may be suffering from too little water. On the other hand, we may be getting more rain, they may be more swollen, there may be more material flowing into them. There is a perception that actually climate change is going to affect the quality of the water we are abstracting. And as a consequence, we're going to have to improve the way we treat water as it comes out of both the ground and out of rivers to put into distribution. We've already discovered that um, the assets that we own, the pumping stations, the treatment works, are becoming very vulnerable. We've had some very high level uh, of, of serious issues of sewage, pump, uh, of sewage treatment works being completely flooded, of water abstraction points being completely flooded. And that has effect it meant locally we couldn't supply the services. And uh, finally, um, all of this coming together with consumption, with flows, etc., with changing rainfall, um, higher temperatures, there is going to be far more stress, and we're going to have to take a lot more notice of how we deal with our resources. If we switch to the Environment Agency, so that was the economic regulator, and you can see that a lot of what it was concerned about was increasing costs, increasing technology requirements. What the Environment Agency is worried about is the flooding. What is going to happen to the people? So we think a 22% decrease in summer rain, and um, by, the, by, by the 2080s, we're looking at a doubling of the number of pro properties that will be in the floodplain. This is for two reasons. On the one hand, if there is inappropriate development. On the other, if we get these changes and more intense rainfall, there will be more properties that will be at risk. So we think there are going to be twice as many properties. And this then means there's a whole lot of issues with insurance and what have you. Um, we think that four billion people um, and two billion pounds worth of assets are going to be risk of flooding from rivers and seas if climate change goes ahead. And um, they have been taking this quite seriously with improving the way in which we can predict and forecast. So the Environment Agency um, in the last 10 years has actually issued, oh, apologies, some four million early warning messages sent to homeowners just to warn them that something might be happening. What we have done is we've produced a nationwide um, flood risk modeling, which is now available to anybody. You can go online. So last week, I went to my village and a town, and I looked at the flood risk map. This is what is expected could happen if we get heavy rain. And what I'm delighted to say is just here is a brand new development, 200 houses. They thought they were going to build 200 houses here, or 400. They were only allowed to build the 200 here, and they were not allowed to build anything there because the National Flood Plan shows that it is high risk. That has been left as green open space for the use of the public. What is really changing in the UK, as I think here in Germany, is the use of sustainable drainage systems. We've had now for 20 years a SUDS manual, which has been developed. Unfortunately, what has happened is that legislation and responsibilities have fallen behind. So although everybody understands these systems, it's still not absolutely clear who is going to be responsible for them. But increasingly, the water companies have become responsible for them. And um, I was speaking a couple of weeks ago to um, one of the managers from United Utilities, one of our big companies, and she'd just been given a new job. She was operations manager for sustainable drainage systems because they had finally realized they had to have a separate operations manager for the conventional sewers and one who would be responsible. 
and she is now finding herself responsible for everything from green roofs right down to the, to the um, uh, surface water sewers going to rivers. And she's starting to think about new ways in which she can maintain and, and, and structure them. And then another thing, and we will see this in, in a couple of the later presentations in Africa and elsewhere, is that there's a big focus now in the UK on the development of natural flood management systems. A curious recent development. Professor, we understand you have to leave, so that's okay. An interesting uh, recent development of, with COVID. During COVID, the British public discovered swimming in rivers. And also, as a result of swimming in rivers, the British public discovered that they contain sewage. Now, I'm, I'm shocked. I thought everybody was taught this at school, but they weren't. There's an awful lot of people who are totally outraged to have discovered that what they flush down the toilet actually goes into the river, which means that there's a risk when they swim. And so what, we have done, what has happened is that um, there's been a huge public um, anger, particularly about what happens with um, the, the combined sewer overflows when sewers and treatment works discharge. And actually what has now happened is that the water companies have now started to issue in real time updates on which of their discharges are discharging when they shouldn't in red here. This is the Thames water area. And which are behaving okay and which are a bit dodgy. And we're looking to almost to the stage now where it would be possible for somebody who wants to go swimming to actually decide um, by going online how safe it is. But what this has meant is there's a huge focus on combined sewer overflows and it's realized that most of our combined sewer overflows discharge because of, uh, they discharge unnecessarily because they're not properly maintained. And this has become a huge focus. It's a large part of what is happening at the moment. The England and Wales water companies, currently every five years they have to uh, submit um, their plans. They've submitted their recent plans for the next five years, between them, they want to spend nine, 96 billion investment to start to address combined sewer overflows and also other aspects of climate change. They want to invest in 10 new reservoirs. They want to create some transfer schemes of water. They want to reduce leakage from water pipes by 28%. They want to remove phosphate from rivers. They want to cut um, about 140,000 sewage spills a year. And there's 11 billion being put into these storm overflows. They want to construct wetlands. So that's how we adapt. As regards to mitigation, the water companies of England have became the first industry in the world to pledge zero carbon by 2030. There is a plan available on the Water UK website. They want to save water as much as possible so that they reduce how much they've got to treat. They're moving into renewable, renewable energy generation. They're wanting to deliver greater energy efficiency. And this includes things like reducing the number of miles driven by their staff. They're starting to produce a lot of energy and they want to export it. They're replacing vehicles. They're tackling emissions from each of their processes, planting trees, habitats, natural solutions. They realize they can't do everything by 2030, so they're now working out what they can't do, how can they offset it. And there is an element to this as well, which is how do they deliver this? One thing they are very conscious of, it's a, very, it's a nice thing to say we're going to do all this mitigation, but they have got to protect customers. So they've got to make sure they achieve it at low cost. They've realized they need to make sure their own leaders are actually properly empowered to deliver it. It's got to be urgent. They want to do it simultaneously by making the water industry simultaneously. They can, they can do all English regions. Um, they're producing an annual emissions report, which can be found, and they're also investing in developing the skills and the people needed. But they can't do it on their own, so they want the British government to come up with an economy-wide transition. They want the British government to prioritize carbon and innovation in net zero. And actually, they would like to do all these nature-based solutions, but there are a few 
legal or responsibility issues that might hinder that, which they need to address. So that was my brief introduction to what is happening in the UK and climate change. And I just want to remind us of one thing. Um, obviously, two years ago, there was a very tragic incident here of Storm Bernard. And actually, Storm Bernard first hit London and caused extensive flooding across London before it moved on and caused such devastation in Netherlands, Belgium, and uh, here in Germany. So we are subject to the same influences. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Ian, for your impressive insights from post-Brexit uh, post and especially your uh, flood risk modeling plan that has been implemented. Mm, I would now like to invite our next speaker of the day, Professor Dr. Simon Tate from the University of Schaeffer. He is the head of various research projects with uh, focus on urban drainage and sustainable drainage systems. Over to you. Okay, uh, thanks very much for the invitation. Um, my name's Simon Tate. I work at the University of Sheffield. Ian was very kind to actually show everyone where Sheffield is because normally when I go overseas and say that I come from Sheffield, everybody looks a bit blank as to where it actually come from. We're one of the largest engineering faculties in the UK uh, and uh, we do have a strong focus on uh, water engineering and water management, particularly in an urban context. And I think my slides are back to front if we've got the final observations first. So let's see if we can go back a bit, shall we? Okay. So one of our earlier speakers said that science is no longer done in, in individual disciplines. So what I want to try and give you is a perspective in the UK and there's lots happening in terms of urban water management in the UK, so I want to take a particular focus. It's not going to be on flooding, it's going to be on our combined sewer overflows. And the reason I want to use that is I think it's a very good example of how politics, climate change and technology all collide together. And maybe the solutions that are going to be adopted may not seem to be the most logical, but they come from this collision of politicians, the awareness of the public, and a changing climate. To give you some background and context, because I think that's important, in 1990, water companies were set up in the UK. So we went from democratically elected regional water authorities to privatized companies that would deliver uh, all our water services, including drainage. The reason for this was that the government at the time didn't want taxpayers to invest in our water infrastructure. It had to be done by private companies who would go to the markets and borrow money to invest in our assets. So in the UK, for our water services, we don't pay taxes. Understand in the UK that the word tax is a very unpopular word. <laughs> so. All our water services in the UK are funded by charges, not taxes, yeah? So our customers pay charges, they don't pay tax. All water companies are monopolies, and because of that, they're heavily regulated. So Ian talked about two of the, the regulators that are important, off what? So the Water Service Regulation Authority, and they're an economic regulator under significant political pressure. They're supposed to be independent, but uh, the government gives them very strong hints as to where the economics of the industry should go. The Environment Agency is there to protect the environment. It's also a regulator of water companies. There's also a drinking water inspectorate. They're quite small, but those are the three regulators that, that regulate our water companies. Water companies have responsibilities. They get their funding from customer charges and borrowing, and they're supposed to uh, meet those responsibilities. So water companies in the UK have a license, a 25-year license. 
They are to provide water services, so water supply, sanitation and drainage within a defined geographical area. And these tend to align with river basins. Um, licenses for 25 years, but within that 25 year period, they have regulated five year asset management periods. So every five years, they have to submit a management and investment plan to off what the economic regulator and the economic regulator decides whether that investment plan is adequate for them to meet their responsibilities. And off what determines how much water companies can charge their customers for the services they provide. So at the moment, we are in uh, moving into 2024, which is the final year of a five-year asset management period. The next one starts in 2025. So the companies have just submitted their draft investment plans for the next asset management period. And at the moment, water company engineers are supplying off what with lots and lots of questions about their investment plan. They'll find out sometime next year between April and September as to whether their plans have been accepted or not. And then they move into 2025 with a five year investment plan. This is very important for companies. Uh, and it has weaknesses. So typically companies used to get a certain percentage above the retail price index, yeah? So when we we're in a situation of low stable inflation, water companies were licensed to print money. You would get maybe 0 0.5, 0 0.8% above inflation and you'd run an infrastructure system, you'd have to improve it, deal with climate change, reduce pollution, but it was quite a stable environment. This five year asset management period the charges were determined in 2019. So we now have gone into a period where energy costs have tripled. Remember, water companies use 3% of the UK's energy. Um, inflation, staff wages have gone up, but the amount they can charge their customers was decided in 2019. So there are one or two water companies in the UK that are under severe financial pressure at the moment. They also have to affect, uh, maintain an effective public sewerage and drainage system throughout their area of operation. And, and we'll come back to this. To give you some idea of the water companies, as Ian said, there are 10 in England. They manage round about 600,000 kilometers of buried pipes. And that's what you would take to be your public sewers. But they also have to manage the connection from the public sewer to people's property. And that was added not this AMP period, but the previous one, basically from political pressure. The government thought it would be a good idea that water companies should be responsible for all connections from the public sewer system to a person's property. And that was mainly due to po political pressure as well. So this is a very early study, and I want to try and give you a chronology of climate change in the UK. So basically, climate change adaptation and uh, knowledge in the UK. We have our central uh, Met Office who do the large uh, climate change modeling, both in terms of the global models and the regional climate models. And they've had about three epochs, if you can think of that. We had our uh, one, they published a lot of data in 2008 and that tended to be climate change predictions on a very large scale. We've had more in 2018, which was much smaller scale, but the Met Office adopted an approach of uncertainty. So they provided us with ensembles of predictions that you could then uh, take in terms of uh, climate change prediction. We've just had another recent set of uh, climate change modeling results, and they've gone away from ensemble probabilistic uh, predictions to predicting on scenarios, uh, emission scenarios, and at much smaller scale. So the Met Office has produced uh, climate change predictions up to 2080 uh, on uh, a reduced 12.5 uh, kilometer square and a two kilometer square. So they've gone from probabilistic type predictions to a scenario based and quite a harsh scenario, but giving us much smaller scale predictions, which is useful for the water industry, 
because all our urban drainage systems are of the scale of a few square kilometres. And that's driven our different changes in the way that we predict rainfall impacts in urban drainage systems. So this is a very early study, 2018. And what we had here is from the Met Office, we, they didn't really think about rainfall intensity or frequency. So all that we were able to do was to take design storms, so statistically based design storms, and uplift the volume of rainfall within that design storm. So this was a, an early study where we looked at, a, it was a, a location in West Yorkshire. So we, we took a hydrodynamic model, a runoff model, a, a combined it with a sewer network model. And we looked at what came out of this model for various design storms and what would come out of our combined sewer overflows. So this column here was if we had no climate change and with the existing rainfall, we looked at the existing rainfall and uh, no, it's 2020. I don't think we've ever gone back to see if our predictions were correct. But uh, this was done in 2007, so it gives us a 10, 15 year uh, extension. Uh, so you can see that the, what comes out of the, the system for various design storms and what comes out of the CSO uh, also increases as well. We also looked at increasing urbanization and saw that it had round about the same impact as climate change. So in terms of uh, urbanization, uh, planning, uh, it uh, has about the same size of impact as climate change over this 15 year period. We also played about with the models and said, well, what happens if we clean the system more, bit better operation, could you actually recover uh, uh, this increase? And by enhanced operation, we didn't want to build lots of new uh, assets. You found that you could recover uh, to some extent what we would predict both from urbanization and from climate change. So from this individual study, we went, uh, the government uh, uh, commissioned a nationwide study that looked at lots and lots of systems throughout the UK and, and their future impact. And that fed into one of the asset management periods, so the next one, that allowed water companies to justify more investment and increase their customer charges. I wasn't quite sure what the, the audience would be, but I want to try and give you some idea of a sort of typical system in the UK. Now, in the UK, we've made a lot of progress with flooding. There was a big focus on flooding for two amp periods. And we've cut the number of houses that are flooded from uh, sewer and drainage networks from several tens of thousands down to a few hundred. And that's involved lots of investment, changes in practice over a 10 to 15 year period. What we're focusing on now are overflows. So most systems in the UK historically would drain into a river. In the 70s and 80s, we put large interceptor sewers uh, that were parallel with the, the natural uh, river in, in a valley, and they would have uh, combined sewer overflows into the river. We added additional storage to reduce the frequency uh, in the 80s and 90s, and we were left with a system that flood risk was managed reasonably uh, low, but our overflows into the river were unknown. Our model said it was okay, but uh, what actually happened was people didn't really know. The other thing that happened was that water companies, there used to be a, a, a sort of justice sort of management system in the UK where you were fined if you broke the law, but you would be fined for the damage you caused. So if the water company did get caught and the damage was relatively modest, they would get a small fine. That changed in 2014 in that the, the Department of Justice, the Ministry of Justice said that the fines people paid should also reflect the ability of the organization to pay that fine. Water companies are quite large organizations with quite a lot of resources, which meant that even if you had a, a relatively modest impact on the environment, you paid a large fine. So this one up here is a water company in the UK. So uh, it was a, 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 a spill from a manhole. 
tend to a, a site of scientific, uh, special scientific interest, so the impact was relatively large. Uh, they were quite uh, uh, guilty because this had happened a few times, and they were fined just under a million pounds for that. So that started to concentrate people's minds. So we started to improve our combined sewer overflow. So that's a, 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 an existing one. So basically, you have a throttle here. If you have too much flow going down, it spills over the two uh, side wheres and then into the water course. We fitted screens in, in most of our overflows. But what was actually coming out, or how often these operated, was really quite unknown. There was a government minister called Richard Bennion, who in 2013 stood up in Parliament and said, I think it's a good idea that water companies know how their systems operate. Why aren't these overflows uh, monitored? Which, of course, the water companies fell over. There was no hint of this at all. It's one of these things. The government minister stands up and says, I think it's a good idea. So they had to do it. Um, about 16,000 overflows in the UK, and they spent 10 years uh, installing event duration monitors, so monitors that will tell you the start of the spill and end of the spill. It doesn't tell you the volume, but it's the start and the end. The other thing about these monitors is um, it's a large program, 700, several hundred million pounds to install. What it was agreed at the start was that the water companies would just report an annual return. So how many hours your uh, overflow was spilling? And that was made public. Now we're starting to move uh, into uh, making this data much more open. And this is another thing that's changed politically in the UK, is the wish of the public to see more data. So this is, uh, yeah, this is the Environment Department's website. This is from last year. So this gives you event duration monitoring, storm overflows, annual returns. So for 16,000 of these overflows, you can go to the government ministry, download all the data, and you get each overflow, where it is, how many times it's spilled, and the hours that it's spilled in that year. This is changing. Next year, what you'll get is you will get each overflow, when it starts, when it stops, for every overflow in the country. So it was great. For the last two or three years, we've got lots and lots of uh, um, newspaper articles saying, this overflow is spilling 6,000 hours a year. And some of them were. No, they weren't spilling occasionally. They were spilling 100 days a year. 50 days a year, some were like 200 days a year. It was almost they were operating all the time, so definitely illegally. So this open data, even if it was quite limited, really started a political debate in the UK as to, you know, you needed these uh, emergency valves to reduce flooding, but was this acceptable? The other good thing about this data is, um, NGOs pick it up. So the government data is in big spreadsheets. You download it, and if you're a scientist like me, it's great. You can do a bit of MATLAB on it and a bit of analysis. But you get lots of environmental NGOs. They pick this data up, and they've got clever people. So this is a website from an NGO called the Reverse Trust. So they've taken all this data. They've got nice infographics. So people can click on the CSO next to where they live. Uh, and it tells you when in the year, how often this overflow spilled. So this is a good one, 255 times a year uh, for almost 6,000 hours. So this really got the public debate going. So you can see almost this, this was 2020, so they hadn't quite got all the storm overflows. How many spills per year? Half a million. 3.5 million hours that these things were operating. So this really put a lot of political pressure on the public and really increased public engagement in thinking about environmental regulation. Nobody discussed this before, right? Not only in the UK, this is a website from Brussels, so again, looks at it. So it led to what was known as the Environment Act. So the Environment Act is not only to protect the environment, but also people's enjoyment of the environment. And water was one of the key areas in the Environment Act. It required 
uh, water companies to have drainage and wastewater management plans for the first time. And it also introduced the stormwater overflow discharge reduction plan. And I'll look at that in a bit more detail. It also required water companies to monitor the water quality upstream and downstream of all their overflows. And that's going to happen over the next 15 years. So it was developed from an evidence project. So it's evidence-based policy development. Uh, we used lots of existing uh, network models. The costings of interventions were based on historical data. And these allowed us to develop targets for this overflow reduction. Um, right. So what we did is lots of existing data was collected into a database. And this allowed us to predict how many overflows we thought would happen, both now and at 2050, because this is a 30-year program, uh, what the damage would be you know, in terms of uh, dilution and mixing, and also what potentially the impact on public health would be. This report was published, and there was a debate about what the future plans should be. And this all came from this visibility of the number of overflows that have been gathered from this monitored data. So this is what was expected from the modeling. Uh, this is the number of overflows that have more than zero spills in 2020. Interesting thing to look at is a lot of them are in the west of the country, in the north. Very, very few uh, in the south. The water companies here have about half the overflows in the country that require attention and about 25% of the customers. This just looks at the dilution ratios. So again, again, the impact on rivers, and this is the impact on bathing waters, is, is really quite different. So this modeling uh, gave some idea of which overflows would need to be uh, uh, done. Um, in this case, the uplifts that we applied were much more, uh, sorry, oh, sorry, uh, the uh, uplifts we used were more sophisticated. We were using the data from the 2020 climate models. So uh, they're still quite pragmatic, but we were taking the changes in rainfall intensity and volume at quite small uh, spatial areas. They were slightly aggregated up to the water company area but we're now starting to account for rainfall intensity and frequency in terms of the climate change predictions, rather than just a, an increase in volume. We looked at a, 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 rain, a river flow reduction of about 3.5%. That's quite coarse, but there's new work continuing with the Environment Agency. So we had these new predictions up until 2050 in terms of spills, impact in terms of water quality and dilution, and impact on public health. So probably the key thing here was this graph here. And I'll explain it. This is about estimated capital expenditure for four different options. F0 is no spills at all. So network enhancement, natural based solutions to have no spills. F5 is five per year, F10, 10, and F20 allows 20 per year. So remember, these are only supposed to operate in heavy rainfall. So you, it's your definition of heavy. Um, if you look at F0 and F5, they are significantly more expensive than F10 and F20. The maintenance expenditure for all these options was round about the same. W was just enhancing the existing sewer and drainage networks. So bigger pipes, more storage. S10 was 10%. Uh, green infrastructure, 90% existing enhancement. S50 was a half and half uh, between green infrastructure and uh, enhancing your natural si your existing system. In the end, the pragmatic political decision was to go for F10. So our policy now is that overflow should not operate more than 10 times a year. The split here, um, to start with, the options that were modeled were W, you know, entirely gray infrastructure, and a 50-50 split of green and gray. 
when these results came out, another modeling study was to do an S10 because it was unexpected that the cost and carbon emissions of the green infrastructure would be so high. So policy now is F10 because the difference in cost between F10 and F20 is, is, is not too big, but it's certainly much bigger between F5 and F10. So there's no science between uh, F10, the decision on F10, it's a political decision, yeah? So only operate in what's now defined as heavy rain, so it's 10 spills, it's a pragmatic decision, but there is an encouragement for green infrastructure, even though it's more expensive and more carbon intensive because of the other benefits that it brings. Again, that's a political decision. We protect the environment with these uh, and also public health. So maybe some final observations regarding this policy. We used existing models and data. Um, there are uncertainty in the models, but you're projecting 30 years into the future. It's what we have at the moment. There were simplified assessments in terms of environmental protection and dilution. Uh, but this adoption of this policy estimate is 60 billion pounds over a 30 year period. Remember, this is 60 billion pounds. The privatized water companies can go to off what and say we need this money to implement this policy. So the money will be provided because it's a statutory requirement. Timescale's long. So the good thing about that is you want to make sure that your detailed regulations are not so strict that you allow for innovation and change over that 30 year period. Um, I'll leave this one out because I think I'm running out of time. The, what I was wanting to say about this one is we also work with the rail industry, although the water industry, they're going through the same pathway. They're about 10 years behind the water industry. So they are just starting at the moment to work out what the impact of climate change is on their assets. And with the rail industry, if you get water over the top of your railway lines, the trains can't go. That's the failure there. So they are starting to do the modeling to work out the impact of climate change on their assets, and they're starting to build an adaptation plan. So the final observations about the UK are utilities are heavily regulated and that means they are heavily influenced by political decisions and climate change ad adaptation. Both the rail and water industries have these five or six years planning periods, but they also require 25 year strategic plans. Flood risk is not the only target. Environmental and public health are also becoming important. So with the railways, they're still on the flood risk pathway. The water industry has moved from the flood risks now onto the environmental and public protection. The really interesting thing in the story, I think, is this open monitored data, because that has driven the public debate. Nobody discussed overflows until about five years ago, yeah? Until the data came out and people were horrified that these things were operating hundreds of days a year hundreds of thousands of hours per year, and that drove the political debate, and that produced new legislation and new policy. Everything's pragmatic. Pragmatic climate change predictions and pragmatic public decisions about investment. Whether we went for F5, F10, or F20, it was a political decision. But the evidence was there to inform the political debate for people to make decisions. Um, different approaches, you enhance your network, green infrastructure, all of different timescales and different costs, but all really are uh, a part of a package to deal with long-term climate change. And there is always the potential for innovation on the timescales we, we operate at. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Treat, for your engaging presentation. Yes, there's a cost you pay. There are uh, circumstances that you have to face when you opt to be open. And uh, nevertheless, uh, new ideas pop up. Inviting our next speaker here, Dr. Tim Ausebeck from IWV. He heads the 
Department of Water Resource Management. Over to you. Thank you for the kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me today. And uh, Ian, our partner city in Mülheim, where IWW is located, is Darlington. So um, we also have a UK twinning city, and we're quite happy about that. Yeah, my name is Tim Austerbeek. Um, I work at IWW, focusing on water resources management. And I was also um, head of the working group at Water Europe of Water and Climate. So I've worked together with, for example, CEH, um, Center for Ecology and Hydrology, and Wallingford in, in England, um, quite closely together. But today, um, I'm going to not talk about Europe a lot, but we will focus on Germany uh, and also on uh, North Rhine's failure today. So when you look at um, drinking water supply in North Rhine-West failure, um, you can see the numbers here. Where, where is our drinking water coming from? And basically, you can see that we have uh, groundwater is the most important source here with um, 47%. But at the same time, if you look at rivers, lakes, reservoirs, and also bank filtrate and managed aquifer recharge, which is also surface water influence, um, then you see that this is um, in a similar range. So basically, we have um, half our water coming from surface in, in, um, influence water, and the other half from groundwater. So that, that is um, important to keep in mind when we also want to look uh, at climate change. Because what I'm going to show you next is that climate change is affecting these water resources quite differently. And it has been affecting these, these water sources already in the past. So I first would like to start to show you a little bit what happened um, in the last couple of years. So how has been the impact so far? And what do scenarios and, and climate modeling and so on show for the future? What we can do expect? So um, if, if you look um, first into surface waters, which, as I showed you, are um, quite important for our drinking water, um, then you, if you look at the number of days where we had summer low flows, and these numbers have been increasing over the last um, yeah, 50, 60 years easily. So from, from 18 in, in 50s to 80s to um, yeah, nearly 29 now. So that, that has been a, a large increase. And this impacts um, our water quality um, also, not only the water quantity. For example, here we have the, the River Ruhr. We are in the Ruhrgebiet area. And um, in this area, um, we use lots of, of um, surface water from the Ruhr, as, um, especially um, as bank filtrate. And um, you can imagine that we have many, many wastewater treatment plants and combined sewer overflows, um, which um, you know end up in the River Ruhr, and sometimes uh, with less than one kilometer downstream from that, we have our raw water uptake for drinking water production. Um, and we also go swimming <laughs> in the Ruhr. We also had a project where we made it possible to go swimming again um, by uh, creating like a green light, red light um, system, um, so which is installed there um, at the river so that you can actually see if, you, if you, it should be possible to swim now based on bacterial concentrations. But so, what I want to show you here is that the number of, of low flows, the number of days of low flows, has, in, has an impact um, also on water quality and hence on, on drinking water. So in water treatment, it was already mentioned, is, is then impacted as well. So we need to, to rethink about how can we treat our, our surface in, in, um, influenced uh, raw water. Um, now, the, the next graph is unfortunately not from North Rhine-Westphalia, because it, they don't have these fancy um, graphs. Um, but this is a map, or a, a graph rather, um, from the state of Hesse, which is uh, right around the corner, which is um, bordering um, North Rhine's failure. Um, so we share some groundwater aquifers, so I, I dare to, to use their data, um, which is, which is um, quite up to date. And what you can see here are groundwater levels. So these are all the groundwater um, wells they have, basically, where they, where they have data on. And what you can see here from January 2018 to last month, October 23, uh, how on average um, the groundwater levels have been developing um, since, especially since we had this, this major drought in 2018, 19, and 20. And red means that um, the groundwater levels were very low compared um, to the previous times. Um, yellow means low. Um, 
and then the rest is normal or high and very high. And what you can see here that, that these droughts, introduced by climate change as well, of course, um, were, had a massive impact on the groundwater levels. And you can see here up, for example, if you look to 2022, um, that 80%, more than 80% of the groundwater levels were low or very low. So this has huge impacts on drinking water supplies, you can imagine. Um, and then if you, if you go then further on now to, to the last few months, you can see that it's going down again. It's been raining um, basically uh, since the last two, three months a lot. So it's good for groundwater recharge. But at the same time, if you think about the single rainwater drop, uh, how long it will take to reach um, the groundwater and then within the groundwater, the raw water abstraction site. So we usually say that for most groundwater aquifers, we, we say that it usually takes 20 to 30 years. So um, then you can imagine that those, those groundwater levels that are still low are mainly deep groundwater, groundwater wells because it takes a long time for the recharge. And you, you can see those, um, those missing water amounts from the past so a few years. You can already still see them um, if you look into groundwater levels. So what we see here is that we First, I showed you the, the, the surface water that we had issues in the past, that we had an increase in, in, in uh, low water um, levels, but also in groundwater that this has been affected. So this is already, this is already a, um, a fact um, for the last decades, or now here for at least for the last five years, which you can see. And then if you look into North Rhine-Westphalia again, um, this has been on the news a lot. So unfortunately, this is in, in German only. We couldn't find any. Um, English newspaper reports here. But um, if, if you look at these messages, they basically say that, that the drought is here and we're afraid of the next big drought and um, in a way, uh, North West Fader is, is drying out. Then drinking water is scarce. Um, please don't uh, use pools anymore, fill pools. Um, don't uh, you know, uh, use it for a garden. Don't you know, save your drinking water for other purposes and not, not for, for pools and, and gardening. So this has been um, in the media a lot, and, and hence we, of course, um, also the drinking water providers, um, they got worried, of course. So that what's, that's why we, when we now saw this and the problems we had that, that also, that are now here, um, we need to look into the future. And we've already talked about, this in, I think Simon already showed us some, some data on, on climate change scenarios. And what you can see here, um, I think most of you know this already, but we basically have, have um, there are four or five, but um, usually people tend to two or three um, climate change scenarios, the um, representative concentration pathways, so the RCPs, they're quite common. Um, before it, it was the ESRA scenarios. Um, so IPCC has been doing that for the last 20 years, providing all this information and, and these scenarios. And what you can see here now is RCP 2.6, which is like the, the, the best solution basically for us, the 1.5 degrees um, if possible. Um, but I mean, honestly, if we look at uh, the COP um, results from yesterday, um, it's uh, gonna be difficult to stay with RCP 2.6. Um, and uh, then we have the worst case scenario, RCP 8.5, the high emissions. And then below here, you can see the, the temperature ranges which globally we would end up um, in 2100. So, and I will show you now some impacts on water availability and on drinking water demand, um, or generally water demand uh, based on 2.6 and 8.5 um, in the next few slides. And this is now a big, big graph. Um, let me walk you through it a little bit. So we have here um, several maps of Germany. So this is first Germany. Um, showing the groundwater recharge here. And you will always see in the, in the first, um, the left upper corner, you see the, the, the past 1971 to 2000. So basically that's what happened um, so far. And then in the next one, you have 2021 to 2050, then 2036 to 65 and 2069 to 2098. So, and in these other maps, so there you can see those white blue colors that are the changes, the relative, um, no, the, the absolute changes you can see here. And um, you will notice that on, at least for RCP 2.6, that the groundwater recharge is in a similar range as today. Um, where you see those, those black lines, um, 
This is where um, less than 66% of the climate models used here um, agree. Um, if we talk about climate models for RCP 2.6, there were, um, I think, 23 climate models used, and for the other one, RCP 8.5, 49 climate models. So that's the biggest climate um, impact study we have in Germany, using 49 um, different climate models. This was done by U of Z, um, and uh, they used the MHM hydrological model um, for the impact on a one kilometer grid all over Germany. And so, what you can see here that the, the changes um, for RCP 2.6 and groundwater recharge are minor, but that is um, a 30 year average. Um, so first of all, it's a good, good message because it shows that um, in the end, we will probably not end up uh, with really scarce condition as some expected, but at the same time, droughts will increase a lot. So we will have like these periods we had now, now in 2018, 1920, these really dry periods where we had lots of problems also with water supply and water availability. These um, will come again and again and they will increase. So we have longer summers, um, we have longer vegetation periods, so the, the environment needs more water itself. Um, the um, irrigation demand will increase and so on. So the water demand will increase and the summers will get drier and longer and hotter. Um, so I, but at the same time, because we have most of the rainfall in the future, based on the predictions, um, will fall in winter, and winter is the time where we have the groundwater recharge. So um, that's why these numbers um, do add up, even though at the first look you think, oh, that's, that, that's not going to happen. Um, but scientifically, it, it, makes, it makes sense. And then if you look into um, RCP 8.5, um, and then if you focus on the lower right corner, um, there you will even see an, um, a stronger increase in groundwater recharge, um, yeah, up to yeah, 40, 50 millimeters per year. Um, well, that's quite a lot. And this is mainly due to that we have more energy um, in the atmosphere. So 8.5 refers to 8.5 um, watts per square meter um, energy. Um, so this is, this is um, a lot of energy that means we have an, an increased hydrological cycle with more rainfall. Um, so that's also if you have hotter temperatures, you have more erosive transpiration. So um, that explains it. But the, the message here is um, that groundwater availability or generally um, groundwater recharge um, should not um, be in decline for a long time at least, on average. But we will have long periods um, with, with droughts and, and problems. So we need to make sure that in the future that the, the winter rainfall, um, that we make sure that, that we um, you know, use it to recharge our groundwater resources. And then if we look into um, North Rhine-Westphalia, um, here you can see a similar graph now also for RCP 8.5, and um, the first graph always is, the, uh, is basically the near future, then the middle one is the future 2041, 2070, and the, the gray one is 2071 to 2100. And uh, here you can also see the groundwater recharges, uh, changes, and um, then these different um, names here, they depict different um, hydrogeological units in North Rhine Westphalia. So they're, they're not too important here, but what you can see is that we see a similar range as we did in the, in the German study. So that uh, you have changes um, of about uh, yeah, zero to 20, 30 millimeters. Um, so that's, that's very similar. So, and this was a completely different um, study done with, I think, 32 or 34 climate models. Then let's, so that was groundwater, but I also said that, that um, surface water is very interesting and, and very important for us uh, with in North Rhine's failures, 50%. And here, this is the same model, MHM model, um, same study. And here they also, because it's a hydrological model, you can also model um, river runoff. And um, what you can see here is basically now only for RCP 8.5, the past, um, then to 2050, 2065, to 2098. And um, what you see here in blue, for example, is the, the current state of the, the river runoff. And then you, you can see uh, how it changes in the future. And for Eastern Germany, um, it looks quite well, again, similar to the study before that, especially in Eastern Germany, um, um, rainfall seems, seems to increase and also runoff. 
But if you look into um, North Rhine-Westphalia and Western, Western Germany, you can see that there are, will be decreases. This is summer runoff, sorry, didn't say that. That's summer runoff. Um, so, and you can't see it probably too well in, in the last rows, but um, most of, of the, the western parts um, are red. Um, so what we increase, uh, what we um, uh, expect a, a further um, decrease in, in summer runoff. So that will have impacts again on drinking water supply, drinking water quality, but also on transportation, cooling, and so on. So that was um, an introduction to, to water availability. Um, now let's talk a little bit about water demand. So we, we can also see that we have um, changes in water demand. So if we look into domestic, we see um, that showers, pools, gardens, um, use lots of water, especially during summer. So usually we, we use 128 liters per, um, per day in capita in, in Germany. But in summer, this, this increases. Um, agriculture, especially in summer, we have the irrigation demands. And for the industry, we have the cooling demands and energy productions in summer, but also ecology demands more water. So summer is a hot spot. And if you, if you look at um, the total um, numbers, then you can see that, that energy takes up most of the, the water in Germany, but also the, the household's domestic demand is 22%, manufacturing 24 irrigation is only 1.3, but these are old numbers, this is much higher now. And then we um, started a research project which was just finished, uh, it's called What Demand, and um, here we looked into water use scenarios for all these sectors I mentioned. And if you, I'm not going to into details, but we found in the end that, that there were six parameters that drive water demand um, for these different, uh, this is now for households. And we produced different scenarios. And I want to show you now the impact of summer days and population, um, what they, they have an impact on water demand in the future. So here are the, the number of summer days. And uh, here you can see once again that especially RCP 8.5, um, if, if you look into that last picture, you can see that the number of summer days um, increases a lot here by yeah, 40 to 50 more summer days in the future. So that, that is um, quite a lot. Um, that is more than we already have in most of the, the regions. And the second driver is uh, population, and um, this is the, the upper scenario, this is NUTS 3 level, um, this is a European um, data set, and this shows you for the 401 districts we have and cities we have in Germany, it shows you the, popu the current population and the future changes. This is basically the upper scenario which says that in 2100 we um, end up with um, 83 million people, which we are currently, so um, the lowest one would say we go down to 65. But you can see that there are some changes, even though we stay with the same number of population, but the changes are there, the cities will gain more people, rural areas will lose some people. Um, so we have some, some um, changes within Germany. So, and then if you look into now the result, uh, this is the water demand um, for 2100 or also for the other time series. Um, and uh, here you can see that, that if you combine both data sets, which I just showed you that um, there is a, a large increase, especially in big cities in Germany, predicted for the future, but also in those where population stays the same, we see an increase, and that is uh, depending on, on climate change. So this, this has a, a huge impact, and we can see that the total increase is 4.1 billion cubic meters per year. Um, yeah, I'm not going to talk about irrigation a lot, um, but uh, we've seen in the study also, um, done by partners who modeled this, is that um, the irrigated area will increase by a factor 2.7, and if you look at irrigation water demand, it will increase by 2.85, so um, increases by 1.2, up to 1.2 billion cubic meters, it says. So this is, this is quite um, a lot of, of water that's needed in the future. So this is my last slide, um, the summary. So, What's the take home message from today? So we see that, that we have um, long-term averages of groundwater recharge that will be similar to today. That's what, what the, the graph I showed you because of the w increase in winter precipitation. But at the same time, so don't, don't take this easily, but because at the same time, it, it will get, we will get many, many problems in the summer times. 
and we will get droughts um, like we had in the last couple of years. We will have an increase in, in surf water low, surface water, low water levels. This also will cause lots of problems. Um, generally, an increase in the extreme events, floods, droughts is expected. And um, we see that water demand for domestic and irrigation purposes is increasing, especially locally. So some areas um, will get more problems. And um, those areas like Berlin or Frankfurt already now have problems. So this, this will further increase. And water use conflicts between the different sectors will increase as, as well. And in the end, um, there are multiple effects for drinking water supply. You know, you need, you need new drawing rights. Usually that you have them for 30, 40 years but you need more water, so you need new rights, which is not easy now um, because of the conflicts. You have water quality impacts a lot now, um, which I mentioned. And you have impacts on infrastructure. Um, for example, um, you need for the distribution network and so on. You have different temperatures. You, you, need, um, you have higher um, daily usages in summer. So you have, some, you have some, some big problems coming out. So water suppliers in the end need to re-evaluate uh, their strategies and you know, think about resiliences and how to improve their systems. And um, this is a big task for us, but not only for us, but I think in the UK, um, you will have them as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Tim Arsabek, for your astonishing facts and figures about water, tra uh, water demand and uh, problems because of migration from rural areas to cities and the uh, uh, groundwater table recharge facts. Thank you so much. Let's move on to the next uh, program. Uh, let's have a small discussion. And that for that, I would uh, like to invite our panel of speakers onto the dais, uh, Dr. Ian Naisbeth and uh, Dr. Simon Tate. Yeah. Up for the questions, gentlemen. Do we have questions from online participants? Ms. Belt? Yeah, please. Maybe. Okay. I start. Um, so thank you very much for the presentation. It's very interesting. I, I was really impressed by the data um, that the UK utilities now gather on the numbers of, uh, of uh, combined sewer overflows. And you presented how the public is using this data. I'm very much interested how is the utility using this data to manage their systems. That would be very interesting. Okay. Um, um, the data has been used by the utilities in a number of ways. Uh, the utilities are required to have uh, sewer network models of all their major sewer networks. So these were calibrated many years ago with a very limited data set. All of a sudden, you now have performance data of how the network actually performs. Mm -hmm. Coupled with, there's much better rainfall data from our Met Office now. So previously, models would have been calibrated with two or three measured rainfall events. We now have almost continuous rainfall data for the whole of the UK at one kilometer square. So we can run models, not in real time, but with fairly realistic data with real system performance data. So companies can now check to see how good their models actually are. The Environment Agency is using this data to prosecute companies. So I think they now have 800 live investigations mm. against overflows that don't appear to perform with regard to their legal permit. And they're estimating as they go forward, they'll probably have another 800 investigations next year as well. Okay. Uh, and, and just to add to that, um, one of the water companies I was talking to recently expects it's going to need to triple that's multiplied by three the amount of work it does on rehabilitating its sewers in order to try to deal with this. They see it as an exercise they've got to do upstream from each one of the CS, the combined sewer overflows. They've got to understand it and they've got to invest in improvements. Can I maybe say one other thing about data? It's not a static process. 
So with the, the event duration monitoring data, you've gone from annual returns to now the companies will do returns almost in real time. So again, there's a, a water, UK water project looking at developing real-time databases for event duration monitoring. So you'll be able to, to see in real time what it's actually doing. The other thing I didn't talk about was the, the discharge reduction plan has three aspects. One's this heavy rainfall, which is the 10 spills a year. There's also an aspect on water quality. So companies are now going to be required to uh, monitor. People have stopped believing in, well, models, shall we say. So to monitor four water quality parameters upstream and downstream of every permitted overflow discharge. Uh, and that data has to be reported in real time. So within an hour. So there is a, uh, the, the program for installing the monitors goes up until 2045. So again, uh, they won't have to probably install it at every overflow because some are quite close, but you're probably looking at thousands and thousands of locations with upstream and downstream water quality monitoring every 15 minutes reported within an hour permanently. Thank you. The next question is from Professor Rija Barton, please. Okay, so uh, I, I would like to talk a little bit about money. So last week I was in a conference where we talked about the influence of climate change on our future energy supply. And all the companies were complaining about the uh, influence of the government and they all talked about that there is no business case on the climate change. So how, how should they invest in, in power stations and so on if there is not a business case? And here I hear again that we need billions of euros for the infrastructure. And where do we get the money? Is it just taxes, charges? Who is paying for all this? In the UK, it's simple. There is no tax in the water sector. It's all customer charges, and it will come in the five-year plan. You know, if uh, companies are required to do something through legislation, that's seen as a justified investment because the legislation's gone through Parliament. That's what people have voted for. If, you know, it, it, it'll come in a customer charge. And th we've, they've done some modelling as to what the impact will be and the customer charges will go up to meet this investment. Simple question, uh, how much increase of these charges would you expect if I see the, if you want to invest billions into the infrastructure? Just for the overflows, it's about it's estimated at 60 billion over about 30 years. So two or three billion a year. I can't remember what it is on each customer's bill. I can find out the number. It's it's relatively modest because it's split over a, not a large number of people over a large number of years. Um, what I should say as well is, this is a bus these are business plans which have been submitted to the Office of Water. They are now considering them, and we will find out sometime next year what their decision is. So whilst there's an awful lot of people who are manufacturers of water quality monitoring equipment for rivers, and people who can fix sewers who are waiting with fingers crossed to see if the ministry, if the offshore regulator will say yes, or the government will blink and say, oh no, we cannot afford it. But, you know, we also possibly have a change of government next year. So we have plans, they are, have been costed, as you say, they've been costed, the evidence is there to justify it but there is still a regulatory political decision to be made about how much extra people must pay. But it will be relatively small extra amount every year. We are looking to sp for 30 years to pay for this. Can I maybe give you an insight into how these plans are developed? So uh, effectively they're big spreadsheets with various sorts of objectives and there are two types of objectives. An objective that's a statutory one to meet legislation and they will based on historical practice, they are almost always funded. Okay, there's an interesting negotiation at the moment because you have a 
a statutory objective in the plan and the water company has to estimate what it's going to cost. And the negotiation there is on the estimated cost, not on whether it will be funded or not. There are also parts in their plan that are non-statutory. Now, water companies can try and provide evidence to the economic regulator that their customers wish that objective to be met. So one of the things uh, in this area might be monitoring of coastal bathing waters. It's not a statutory requirement, but a number of water companies are arguing that their customer base are expecting them to do it. So they'll put a cost in their investment plan in that, and if the argument that their customers want this, you know, <coughs> evidence of surveys or whatever else, uh, particularly water companies with large coastal communities. You know, the, the, the tourists and everything else, so they want coastal monitoring, even though it's not a statutory requirement. And again, they estimate the cost, and if the economic regulator is convinced by that non-statutory business case, they will be funded for that. And it goes into the customer charge, of course, but that's, that's the way the system operates. It, it is very important that the water companies must show that the customers actually want they ask for the customers what they want, but then the customer obviously has to pay. And that is where the regulator comes in to try to decide what, it will, what will happen. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any further questions? Yeah. One second. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation, especially from the UK. Um, I'm just wondering, is there any measures uh, to reduce the consumption of water. Of course, there is a market measure. Pricing is there. Uh, you know, pricing indirectly regulates the water consumption. But is there any other restrictive measures taken by yeah. the government on this direction? And the question for Tim is, um, you, know, you, you nicely showed the water supply and demand. But does it also include, does, the, does this model also include the bottled water supply, suppliers in Germany? No, OK. Um, so, so one Thank of the you. things with the UK is that the water companies have had an obligation going back many years now to reduce the per capita consumption by one litre per person per day per year. Excluding beer. Excluding beer. Yeah. So the, <laughs> the, what has happened there is that they might just put in some measure um, to reduce it, which could be, it, it could be anything from encouraging people to use less water to changing the way they shower and bath, um, washing machines with less water, all these things, it all adds up. So they might be able to get five litres in average in one year. That means they don't have to bother for the next five years because they it's a cumulative effect. But we're trying to drive down steadily one litre per person per day per year has been an ongoing exercise. How that is achieved is up to the water companies how they do it. Quickly respond to that, the question regarding the bottled water. Um, so they're ind indirectly affected. Um, because in, in Germany, we um, mostly use um, tap water because it's, it's very often tested. It's really high quality and you can always drink it. So people rely on that. Um, but if you drink um, bottled water, I mean, they're affected that they also have, have uh, drawing rights, for example, to you know, use groundwater, for example, and fill it into bottles. And they also have um, sometimes no problems to get the drawing rights because their water use conflicts. There was a big case in northern Germany, um, Lüneburg, where Coca-Cola, for example, is producing bottled water. So um, th there were some, some conflicts, and this is expected to increase in the future as well. Thank you. Further questions, please? Thank you very much. I have a question for Dr. Alistair Beek. Um, very interesting presentation, and I saw there's actually a, like a shifting of balance. There's now more uh, rainfall in winter and drier periods in summer, so we need to rebalance, take measures to hold this water. What are these measures? That What can we do? Yeah, that, that's a really good question, and that's currently what we're discussing um, about a lot. So we had the National Water Dialogue and in Germany, and um, I was there for all the meetings, and it was very intense. Um, intense discussions, but in, in the end, um, 
we, we need multiple strategies. There's not this one solution. So we, we need technical solutions, of course, you know, like, like reservoirs and so on to, to keep the water, you know, in, in the area. But also you need to, um, you know, you need to increase um, infiltration capacities. So you can do that, for example, naturally that you have these, these um, uh, if, if you do agriculture, for example, um, that, that water stays after rainfall for some more time on the soil, that it doesn't run off or drain um, or leave the area via a drainage, so that it, the water has more time to infiltrate. So then there is this managed aquifer uh, recharge so that you use this water, you keep this water also, and then you infiltrate it into your groundwater to, to raise your groundwater levels. Um, but there are so many, so many options um, that are available, and I think we, we need them all. Um, you know, wherever there are um, sufficient in, in specific areas. There's not one solution fits all, but, but I think there are solutions, and many, many um, areas already have ideas how to implement them. And then I have a follow-up question, because in the beginning, uh, the, your ministry minister talked about no boundaries. Uh, I'm myself from the Netherlands. And I know that, that measures taken in Germany have influence on, on the river levels in the Netherlands. So is there also international collaboration on this, these measures? Yeah, I think, I think on all levels. Um, so we have it in, in a, in a research-based level. We have corporations, of course. We have the Interreg projects, um, which are usually among different countries. Um, and there are many I know regarding water between the Netherlands and Germany. Um, but also the states are working closely together, state of North Rhine is failure, um, and also the drinking water providers work closely together. So um, I think they, even though the systems might be different, um, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm confident um, that this already helps and this will improve the situation in the future as well. Um, we have an online participant, Salma, and she posts a question to you. Uh, she asks, I would like to know more about water supply systems in NRA. Are the public or private? Who decides on the domestic water pricing? Are there basic rights to access and to what limit? Many questions, <laughs> 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 but, but they're good ones. Um, yeah, um, basically the, the water price, if we start with the water price, um, it's, um, it's different um, to the UK because it's also we also have tax. Um, for example, but usually the water price depends on, on the local conditions. So if you have a, you know, a difficult water, raw water to treat, um, then, then it will be more expensive. So the water price varies um, within Germany, also locally it can, can vary. Um, for example, now we have um, some water providers have now big problems with PFAS, um, you know, the pamphlet uh, accolade substances and um, now they need to invest a lot into um, their, their drinking water treatment and now the price has increased from I think it was one euro 20 to two euros per, per um, cubic meter. So um, th there has been um, a big increase and um, in the future we can expect that the price will increase locally where we have you know less, wa less good water quality because of climate change and that it will be more difficult to treat different water sources. Um, so that was the first part of the question. What, what was the other question? Sorry. Uh, are the okay? Yeah. Are the water supply systems private or public? Yeah. And uh, what are the basic rights to access and to what limit? So they they are um, not private. So you have water um, supply companies that are usually um, not in in fully private hands, like for example, uh, like Coca-Cola I mentioned, they would not be able to run the water supply, for example. Um, but um, there, of course, they 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 um, are Im important and they also um, have to follow specific political and regulation rules. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned the, the drawing rights, for example, so they ha do not have as much access to um, water as they like because they need to apply for drawing rights, for example. Mm -hmm. So they need a specific amount of water and they need to, every time they need to renew their rights, um, they need to talk to the government and say, now I need two million cubic meters more. Mm -hmm. um, and then they need to explain why. And then if there's a problem because there's already less water available, then, then this will be problematic. And this is currently a big issue in Germany. Okay, thank you. I think I see no further questions. Oh, sorry. 
extremely sorry. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. So STC is a conference on, on uh, NRW um, and uh, NRW and uh, UK and the Commonwealth. I'd like to know from a panel, how did Brexit affect the water industry in UK? Okay, uh, as a personal view, um, I don't think we'd have had the Environment Act without Brexit. I think it was the government showing that they were going to have some UK legislation to protect the environment because it went through Parliament like a rocket, really quickly. And to give you an example, the water quality requirements to measure four water quality parameters upstream and downstream of uh, permitted overflows, I don't think they really thought that through because we're now in the regulation stage of how you're actually going to deliver that piece of legislation and it's not as obvious as you think. You know, you are asking people to measure four water quality parameters at a high enough frequency to determine environmental impact. Now, the environmental impact is stated, the, the method of defining environmental impact is stated in the legislation, which is quite unusual. It's really quite a detailed piece of legislation for, for, for legislation. It's not general principles. It really is politicians showing that they really didn't uh, trust water companies, and to some extent, their civil servants to produce legislation that would protect the environment. So with the water quality uh, measurement, it's, it's at the limits of technology. They're wanting it measured, it looks like every 15 minutes, in near real time, and published in near real time. So yeah, I think it's a bit, uh, probably one of the few benefits of Bre Brexit, actually. <laughs> To contrast it with the European Union, it's revising its urban wastewater treatment directive just now, and it's still, it, it's moving there. It's got a pace it will get there in the end, but it's much slower than the Environment Act in the UK. Thank you. I suppose my comment would be that it has made export and import a little bit more difficult and expensive, and the free flow of Worker, people working across the different countries. So um, I was worried that we would see uh, quite a, a, a reduction in that. It hasn't really been happening. I, I think we're still managing to exchange ideas and we're still managing to exchange uh, staff and to work together and cooperate. So I'm hopeful that Brexit has not affected us from that respect. Uh, the, the free flow of workers is an interesting one. Um, we, in the UK, we've also always had a problem with not having sufficient engineers. Yeah. So when we dealt with flood risk uh, in terms of water companies with modelling and everything else, a lot of that was done by European engineers moving to the UK and working in the UK. Our current estimates is we probably need about 1,700 extra hydraulic engineers able to model and manage systems to meet those 10 spills criteria. We don't have those 1700, so we're actually having to start to look at additional training, additional capacity building to actually meet this program. We won't have the option of getting well-trained European engineers coming in to help us. Thank you. There's another question from online participant, Dr. Osman, and he says, if due to climate change, recharge is going to change, then it is also going to affect already designed parameters of existing sewer systems. If yes, then what could be possible consequences? Was the question regarding sewer systems? So what does it affect yeah. sewer systems? Already uh, designed parameters of the sewer systems. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, groundwater processes are usually a, a bit slower, but um, if we talk about sewer systems and combined sewer systems, then we usually talk about heavy rainfall, and heavy rainfall um, events will increase um, in the future, and they already have increased in, in, in the last decade. Um, so this will also, similar to what I mentioned about the, the drinking water infrastructure, also the wastewater infrastructure um, will need to be um, re-evaluated to think about, you know, where do you have which capacities um, and 
as it was mentioned, it, we need to um, you know, decrease the number of combined sewer overflows. Mm -hmm. and, uh, especially we need to know better what's inside there. Now we look at maybe bacteria, um, for example, but also um, if we, for example, if it's, if it's an urban area, we have lots of microplastics in there. Um, but also if it's an agricultural area, you have m many pesticides in there. So we need to think about the areas that surface runoff from heavy rainfalls, um, if it ends up in, in combined sewer overflows or goes in diffuse sources to the, to the rivers, um, this will also lead to a decrease in water quality. Maybe some comments. Um, I talked about the evidence project where they modeled water companies, took as their network models and modeled current rainfall. So they came up with about a quarter of a million spills. Um, with the EDM monitors, it was closer to 400,000. And that's principally because there was uncertainty in the models, but also the models didn't take into any operational failure. So the models run as a system as built that should work you know, without operational issues. The interesting thing from going from a philosophy for modeling to build infrastructure that's compliant to one where you actually measure the performance is that, you know, how good are our models, our rainfall models that are predicting future rainfall, uh, along with our existing infrastructure models? And for the first time, on a countrywide basis, you're going to get the answer, because there's going to be sufficient monitoring to get the actual performance of your infrastructure system and not the modeled performance. And that's going to be very interesting as you move forward to, to, to get to the system performance that you desire rather than the system performance that you predict. Thank you. I think we head now to the quick coffee break and meet in about 25 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Failure. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the next part of this presentation really takes us to start to look at the issues at the world scale. So, um, my colleague um, Ashvini Osaka, she is actually going to be explaining a little bit more about why climate change is happening in India. And then we are hearing a little bit more about um, parts of Africa, about how that change takes place. And what I have realized, having seen myself previously, the presentations that we've just had, and then the presentations we're going to hear, I think you'll be struck by a lot of similarities, and actually similarities of an approach, which are being taken in some places. And what I hope is that by the end of this, it will also help all of us to perhaps understand and take a a bit more notice of what is happening with COP24 and to why we need to worry about what is happening worldwide with climate change. So I would like to invite my colleague Ashvini to come and to explain to us what is happening in her home country rather than her adopted country, which is here in Germany. Today I'll be talking about India, climate change, and uh, certain places, specifically two places where uh, floods, droughts, and avalanches are ought to happen, and how climate change is adding to it. 
So that is my focus. To understand that, we'll have a quick overview of physical features of India, sources of water, how rainfall is affected, diverted, because of these physical features of India. <coughs> yeah. So apart from that, once I've covered these topics, we'll talk about the climate adaptation and mitigation policies that have been planned uh, in the upcoming years that have been launched this year, and um, how uh, can we expect the change and how can we chase net zero? Yeah. So coming to climate change, is it addressed in India? Yes, it is. Of course it is, and it is quite alarming issue uh, when compared to other countries. Because on one hand, we are developing, we need to build infrastructure. On the other hand, we have to not commit the same mistakes that the developed countries have made. It's just that we do not know how differently can we perform. What are the key indicators? The key indicators are, are everywhere on networks, on news operators. We have uh, alarming issues of temperatures raising up. We have uh, extreme and unpredictable weather conditions coming up. Uh, just last uh, first week of December, we have heard Chennai floods, and uh, we'll, we'll be talking about that as well, and how deserts are getting hotter and how they are spreading, how they are spreading. You talk about the diversity of India, it's so huge, and hence it's so challenging to bring about these changes when compared to other developed countries. It is not that, it is not acting, it is not that, it is denying there is lag. There is definitely lag, and we have to understand why is this lag. This lag is because environmentalism of the rich versus environmentalism of the poor. This, this is the fact that we understand. We should understand the difference between the approach the developed countries are taking up and the approach the developing countries are looking forward. So <clears throat> to understand this approach and to understand how huge India is, everybody here knows, Ian also mentioned, I've just put a small picture so that you visualize that almost the Europe is placed on top of India's map. And that huge it is, with huge and diversified physical features. You name it and we have it. You name desert, we have it. You name uh, snowy mountains, we have it. You name plateaus, we have it. So we have coastal areas. So we'll talk, we'll talk and we'll understand how the existing droughts and floods are being influenced by climate change. Yeah, so India is called Peninsula. To understand in, uh, uh, India in a very uh, effective way, I remember my geography uh, lecturer told me that imagine India as a person standing like this. And then you have, it's called Peninsula because it's covered with land on one end, on top, and it is covered with the Arabian Sea here on the west with Bay of Bengal on the east and you have Indian Ocean in the south. We'll talk about mountains here. I'm not talking about um, the uh, small mountain ranges. I'll only be talking about huge mountain ranges here. We have Himalayas extending from north towards east. Then you have, oh, sorry, doesn't work. My dear colleague, come please. Okay. So yeah, it's beautifully protected, you see here. You have mountains on every end. Too far? Okay. 
Yeah, after the Himalayan mountains from north to the east, we have Aravali ranges here. And these Aravali ranges separate the desert area from the western Rajasthan to spreading it over to the eastern Rajasthan. So naturally, our natural features are protecting us from other countries, from um, the deserts from spreading. And when you come further down, you have Vindhya ranges and Satpura ranges. These ranges divide the northern peninsula and the southern peninsula, and they form. OK, you have Western Ghats here. When you talk about Western Ghats and Himalayan, Ghat, Himalayan mountains, Western Ghats are more mature. They are older mountains, and um, they are higher when compared to the eastern ghats that form at the eastern uh, place. And the, the, the peninsula region is tilted towards the east. That is why the peninsula rivers that I'll be talking about in the coming slides flow mostly from the west towards the east. They originate in the western ghats, and then they, they flow into the uh, Bay of Bengal. Between the Eastern Ghats and Western Ghats, you have Deccan plateaus. They are very rich in uh, minerals and iron ore. So is Chota Nagpur Plateau. And then you have Purvanchal Mountains. And these mountain ranges, you see that they are from the north to the east, between to the west and to the east. What happens? How, how are they contributing to the rainfall? Uh, we'll see. Uh, in the upcoming slides. We'll talk about sources of water. Sources of water is rainfall, mostly. We have monsoon reason, uh, uh, season, unlike um, in Germany. We don't have explicit season for rainfall, but in India, we have three dedicated months where, ha where we have um, monsoons, or the rainfall. And uh, we'll talk about ground groundwater and um, Let's see, how, how is availability and consumption of water subjective to state? You see that India is beautifully covered with oceans and seas, and yet we have three months of monsoons, and we have groundwater depleting. We have groundwater issues. Water is being transferred to places, to metro cities, through tankers. Why? Where have we come? Why are we at this stage? This is the same city, Mumbai. You see that in localities, water is transferred through tankers here. And then at the same um, end, when we talk about climate um, finance, climate justice, this is another um, uh, irony that houses have water fountains and private swimming pools. It's not a resort or a hotel, it's a, it's a house. So yeah. It, it, the availability of water is subjective to finance and to availability. Let's understand uh, the main source of water. Uh, those are the rivers and how their characteristics are, how the drainage patterns are, how the erosional nature is, and how the basins are. When you talk about Himalayan ri rivers, they are in the youthful stage. Himalayas were formed by the tectonic movement of the plateaus, and then they were emerged. They are very young mountains, and they are subject, subjected to avalanches. They do not have uh, solid rocks. They have soil in between that binds them. And when, on the north end, you have um, natural calamities like cloudburst, or you have heavy rainfall, because of the heavy rainfall and heavy intensity of the rainfall, the soil erosion occurs between these rocks and the bond is lost, and then these Himalayan ranges are susceptible to natural avalanches. Avalanches are ought to happen there, and climate change is adding on to it. Uh, how Himalayan ranges are um, yeah, in their youthful stage, and they form deep and V-shaped valleys, and they uh, form deltas, and they, lo they have long catchment areas. We have three major, I'm not talking about tributaries here. If we talk, it'll take longer than an hour. So we have main uh, three Himalayan rivers here, Indus, Ganges, and Brahmaputra. Coming to the other two exceptional rivers uh, originating in uh, Vindhya Ranges and Satpura Ranges, which flow in the opposite direction towards the west, and the peninsular rivers, which are more mature, which form estuaries, 
and deltas which have shallow valleys and have small catchment areas when compared to the Himalayan rivers flow, originate from the Western Ghats and flow into the Eastern uh, Bay. When you talk about rainfall and distribution, <laughs> rainfall is seasonal, it's uneven, it's uncertain, and we have southwest monsoons, like I told you. When the southwest monsoons, we have currents, uh, yeah, we have southwest currents. If you see map of India here, with the dark green marking on the coastal areas of the Western Ghats, you see heavy rainfall. And as the color gets lighter, you have very low to no rainfall. And you also see in eastern part of India, you have highest rainfall region. This is because of the topography of India. When the air currents from the bay encounter the uh, Western Ghats, you have this orographic rainfall when the currents meet at 90 degree and then they pour down. After the Western Ghats, you have semi arid region, uh, region where clouds cannot be trapped and then they travel, the currents travel further along with the clouds and then Towards, heading towards the east, you have a funnel-like structure between the mountains, and then you see there a place called Chirapunji, which has highest rainfall in the world. So we have Thar Desert on the west side, and we have highest rainfall recorded in the world on the eastern side. We have coastal area on the western side and eastern side, and we have snowy mountains. So. So the challenges are different. We cannot have one solution for the entire country. But we cannot hide behind this. We cannot hide always saying we are very populated, we have a lot of challenges. No, we cannot hide, but we can be fair. Here is where climate justice can, comes into picture. These are the currents that I was talking about and how they are of, uh, coming from the bay, and when they hit the Himalayan ranges and come back, you have retreating monsoons. So monsoon reason, uh, season is from July to September, and then retreating monsoon is two months after, so October, and sep October and November. Mm, yeah. Coming to uh, groundwater tables, they are depleting, they are depleting drastically, and we see a decline of uh, 33 centimeters per year and um, when you see that water utility, we have agriculture, we have fertile land, and 70% of our income is through agriculture, and agriculture means more water demand. And when you talk about anthropogenic causes of climate changes, I need not talk about these causes, it's same, more or less the same in every country. And uh, when you talk about emissions in India, we have four uh, equivalents of uh, carbon uh, emissions uh, of greenhouse gases. We talk about climate change and water resources. We have, have different uh, water cycle to talk about or to consider. We have agriculture sector, that means we have pharma, we have, bio, we have um, polluted systems, rivers, and uh, seawater systems. So the challenges are even more uh, when compared to the previous years. Yeah, now what happens when we have combined effect of natural causes and anthropogenic causes? This is our um, normal year when we have the trade winds coming from South America towards Australia and India. These trade winds are stronger and then they move. When they move, you find that these micronutrients come up. So South America is very good in uh, fisheries. And uh, then the warmth is all transferred here and then you have precipitation in Australia and India. What happens when these currents become stronger? When these become stronger, then you have the event called La Nina. Everybody must be aware of this. Uh, when we have strong trade winds coming towards, then there is even more warmth, and then we have floods coming up. And when we have the reverse effect, El uh, Nina, Nino, then you have exact opposite, where it should not be raining. Here, because of the strong um, La Nina effect, you find uh, forest fires, and here you find uh, that there are uh, floods coming up where there is no rainfall expected. And then in India, we uh, end up having uh, lesser trade winds and lesser uh, currents, and then no, drought, uh, no monsoons, and then eventually droughts. So the natural calamities, along with anthropogenic causes, 
are now, we cannot call it climate change anymore, we call it climate crisis now. So these are the two examples that I was emphasizing on, before and after, this is the event where uh, Kedarnath is a place where uh, we had cloud burst and avalanches, and these are the photographs before and after, and this is the picture of Chennai floods, which happened just last, uh, first week of December this year. So Chennai is subjected to floods. It is ready for floods, but it is not ready for the floods contributed by climate crisis. There is where we have to act on, and we have to act fast. We always talk nowadays about climate mitigation. We have COP events coming up. We have uh, leaders and ministries talking about mitigation policies, but now adaptation has been, uh, in recent days, a, a abandoned kid. A uh, few examples of uh, adaptation strategies in Tamil Nadu. Uh, Chennai is the capital of Tamil Nadu. Tamil Nadu is the only state and the first state in India which has made rooftop rainwater harvesting a mandate for old houses, for huts, for new houses, for buildings, for whatever. You name it and it has to have this. And now uh, Tamil Nadu has this, uh, implemented this successfully. This has been adopted by other states like Rajasthan and Delhi. They are um, all over India. We have sustainable agriculture practices now and uh, multifunctional surfaces and green buildings and many more other um, strategies. Um, let's come back again to mitigation measures. Um, India has promised in COP15, COP26 that we'll um, achieve net zero by 2070. And now you know the reason how challenging it is and why it is 2070 and not 2030, like other countries. And um, in order to achieve these uh, targets, um, the outlook that India has set up, sorry, is uh, they have recently, on 1st December this year, they have launched a green credit, uh, which emphasizes on climate justice and uh, finance, to which uh, World, ba World Bank pledges to aid agriculture and uh, other stock farming industries for 18 other countries in 18 upcoming months. There are other upcoming interesting projects. India, they say when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. So we have desert. What we have done with the deserts? We have planted biggest solar power park in Thar Desert and uh, another park in Karnataka to fulfill the targets that were promised to achieve by 2030. Then you have uh, another upcoming and very interesting project is uh, this project which is inspired from South Africa, oh, sorry, Africa, um, African project called Green, Great Wall of Africa. This project is called Aravali Green Wall Project and it is launched this year. It has promised which I talked about. We are exploiting these mountain ranges. This is the Aravali range. And we are now planning to have this stretch five kilometer wide and 1,400 kilometer. 1,400 kilometer is the distance between NRW and UK. So that distance, five kilometer wide planted plantations. And not relying on government. There are a few steps taken by individuals and communities. Uh, this, is the, this is the example that I also uh, presented in my university, that where there are already droughts, no rainfall, how will you plant trees? So there comes an injection dripping in drought-prone zones. You have plants here, and see, the, sorry. Yeah, you see that the plants were su supported with a five liter bottle with injection dripping and this, this was sufficient for one month for the crops to survive. And you see the after effect. This is the reference point. This is the house. And then you see before and after three years. So there are other techniques also. Awareness is the key for adaptation and mitigation success. Um, in schools, there is a practice that the kids, while going home, they collect water and plant uh, use the water for the planted trees in their premises. You have different schools. For example, St. Xavier School, it's very popular. It has made farming and uh, uh, such awareness-related subjects mandatory in its curriculum. 
So this is where maybe other ministries can also uh, consider. This doesn't come again. To the next slide, please. Okay. Yeah, okay. There's another example from city Mumbai. Mumbai is known for its monsoons, for its skyscrapers, for its um, slums, and yet water is being transported through um, tankers. So there's a gentleman here, 92 years old. He has made his society, his building of 22,000 people self-sustainable. There is zero waste generated in this building. There is, they are energy surplus. They are uh, the groundwater recharge is so surplus that they have recharged their surplus for next five years. Imagine that every community, every society does this on their own to contribute towards the climate crisis that we are facing. They have solar, solar panels, so they are surplus in energy too. Uh, to the next slide, please. I think that was it. Yeah, the next slide is about conclusion. As uh, mentioned by uh, Professor Andrea Kinley also, that climate change is not going to knock your door, ask your nationality, ask your address, and say, yes, I'm going to hit you hard. No, that's not going to happen. We have to work collectively. We have to act fast. And we have to act effectively. That was me. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we now have the, the first of two online presentations. So I'm uh, pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Manuel Krauss from the FIW, who's going to give us a bit of an update on smart water management in Africa. Over to my expert team at the back. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me in the room? Perfect. <laughs> Great. So is my presentation shared? No, it's not shared. Yes. I should. It is shared now. It's shared now? OK. Yep. Just disappeared. OK. Perfect. So, thank you very much for the friendly introduction. Have a nice afternoon also from my side. I'm currently in the beautiful city of Kigali at the IWA Water Development Conference and Exhibition. I'm here in Kigali to provide in a technical sessions insights of early warning systems. And the training sessions is also basing for deriving training of trainers, teaching curricula, which will be integrated in the African Academy for Water and Sanitation. Within my role of being head of the regional chapter Africa of German Water Partnership, we are partnering with the African Water and Sanitation Association and support um, the association and the foundation of the academy. In the next 15 minutes or so, I will give you an overview of the activities of our international cooperation division of the topic of um, water reuse and climate smart water management and reflect on what we can take away from that. Of course, it's not my work alone. It is based on a wide variety of projects that we have carried out over the past three years together with our national and international partners. This year in Africa was also tackled by severe floods. Also here in Rwanda. And already in January, several floods have been recorded. This continued over the whole year. So getting more resilient to increased flooding events is one of the major tasks. If we have a look at a drought map of Africa, you can also see that some parts of Africa are in a drought situation. A prolonged Prolonged drought situation is happening, especially in the Maghreb states in Northern Africa and also um, in Sudan. In the past three years, we have worked on over 16 projects in 13 countries. 
the majority of which were in Africa. This year, Senegal, Botswana and, and Kenya were added as new project countries. And we are also able to successfully restart our cooperation with the Water Authority in Tunisia. Thematically, our projects address the water food energy nexus with a focus on water. The focus is on water infrastructure management, water reuse, integrated assessment and adaptation to climate impacts of drought and heavy rainfall events. Looking more closely at global trends in food security, a recent IPCC report suggests that climate change will adversely affect all four pillars of food security, including food availability and access. Food security would be particularly affected by a decline in water availability and also quality. And yields are expected to fall by around a third by 2100 to, due to changes in temperature and also precipitation. Overall, increasing demand for water in cities is leading to competition between urban and agricultural uses. The extent to which wastewater can be transformed from a problem to a solution for water and food conflicts is a very hot topic. In order to enable the safe reuse of wastewater in agriculture, it is necessary that the pathogens contained in the wastewater do not contribute to health hazard. In this case, you can see the goat that enters the home garden. The measure is clear. Either we eat the goat or we build a fence around the garden. With that, we can protect our food. The fence and wastewater utilization is of course a set of rules that defines the requirements for treatment and application. Worldwide, there are already various national and supranational guidelines for direct water reuse in agriculture. The World Health Organization also published guidelines for the safe reuse of wastewater in agriculture in 2006. In my view, this is a very practical, practicable risk-based approach that enables safe and cost-efficient water reuse in agriculture. We can have a closer look at the climate projections in some of our partner countries. You can see that it, it is precisely in North Africa and the Sahel region that temperatures are expected to rise the most and that Morocco and South Africa will see the greatest decrease in average annual precipitation. In our projects, we develop solutions for climate adaptations with our partners in our African um, project countries and Germany. In Cameroon, we currently are testing a customized low-cost system, um, cons low cost, um, water treatment system consisting of sedimentation, trickling filters and downstream slow sand filters to purify dom domestic wastewater. We are using plastic lids from drinking bottles as low-cost filter materials, a system that has already been successfully trialed by the University of Stuttgart in Germany and in Germany, and also we tried it in Peru. There's no shortage of irrigation water in a tropical country like Cameroon. However, there's a lack of cost-effective wastewater treatment systems to prevent epidemics. If these systems are associated with a direct benefit, acceptance of them may also be increased. In South Africa, on the other hand, um, we will not. Um, we are going to start a new project where we will we'll use uh, treated wastewater for further treatment. Here, we not only want to produce irrigation water in the Buffalo City metropolitan region, but also enable it to be reused in a pilot plant for industrial purposes. For example, in a in a plant of Mercedes-Benz. In the Buffalo City metropolitan region, the question arises as to what the valuable resources of water should be used for in the event of a drought. Drinking water, irrigation water, or industrial use. The industrial use is important in the region to prevent the migration of essential industries due to climate change. In Tunisia, we work with a combination of nature-based solutions and desalination to use um, poorly treated wastewater for aquaponic systems. Here, the water was used to successfully plant basil to produce fish and also roses. And in Ghana, together with, uh, like, um, with the Ruhr University in Bochum, also leading by the Ruhr Universität of Bochum, there was also 
um, wastewater further treated and reused for agricultural purposes. In Kenya, um, this is where I will work with, I'm working with my colleague, um, Ben Simati. Uh, efficient water management is especially important in the Evas and Giro Basin. And here, um, uh, increased use of water in the upper valley can lead to also a uh, tryout of the river in lower areas. In Morocco, we are also working on how we can get increased yields or the same yields with the same with less amount of water. And this was achieved with deficit irrigation and the use of hydrogels. In test plots and pot trials and feed trials, a positive effect was demonstrated in the cultivation of melons and onions. In the case of onions, approximately constant harvests were achieved with a 50% reductions in irrigation and the use of hydro chills. Also regarding flooding, we are conducting, conducting different projects. We are evaluating how social sensing, this is the monitoring of real-time posting on social media platforms like Facebook, or Twitter, or YouTube, can contribute to assess flooding extents and also support a post-flood evaluation. On the right side, you see some examples from the big flood in Germany in 2021 and of a recent flood in August 2022 in Iran. And with this post, you can also post evaluate the causes of flooding and find out maybe if certain structures like bridges were increasing the extent of the flood. In Ghana, we developed with partners a flood early warning system for two catchments. One of is the flood early warning system for the Sakomono Basin in Accra. Here we work together with engineering companies and also with a local municipality and people living um, in the catchment area. In Cameroon, we are coordinating a research project where we developed and implemented emergency water supply concepts, including training of trainers, the installation of treatment plants, the development of guidance documents, and supporting apps. With all these measures of, for climate adaptation, we always have to be aware also of maladaptation. For example, wastewater reuse has a potential in Germany of roughly 5% of the yearly precipitation. Nevertheless, we have to keep in mind that we are already using treated wastewater indirectly over abstraction of surface waters. There are rivers with more than 50% of treated wastewater in low flow conditions. Therefore, the reuse potential is in some catchments also limited. My colleague, um, Tim Austerbeek, also presented some data of the rural well, rural valley before. Concluding, water is a multifaceted, is multifaceted as its sources and uses. Clim climate smart water management requires a holistic picture of meteorological, social, and social economic conditions to develop sustainable solutions for different levels. To holistically increase the water and food security in Africa or Germany, the resilience of individual components must be strengthened. The system is only strong as its weakest link. Water is finite. It's, if taken from one place, it's missing in another. Adaptation measures must always consider the entire water cycle in order to assess the consequences of measures. And the global trend towards climate change adaptation must not displace fundamental principles of integrated water resources management. With this, I would like to conclude and thank you for your kind attention. Yes, Dr. Kraus, thank you very much. What is, what is the time in Kigali now? Is it? Um, it's 5 p.m. 5 p.m. Oh, so it's only a one hour difference. Thank you very much for coming and joining us uh, with a fascinating range of different projects. I think this is part of the strength of the JRF is that we are all doing so many different things. And it's important to have events like this to start to realize what we are all doing. And then we can look to the future as to how we can do all this better together. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd next like to invite um, Dr. Subramanian to come and give his presentation 
on um, paradigm shift, changing um, challenges in sanitation. Uh, there has been a slight change to the order for technical reasons and to do with our, um, the final speaker who's going to be joining us from Kenya after you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, thanks. My presentation will be a little bit different from all this because we'll be focusing more on the sanitation in the global south. And uh, yes, next slide, oh sorry. Yes, just to introduce myself, um, I focus more on the, I specialize and focus on the institutions, process, and decision-making arrangements um, that shapes water management and its implication on public health and on disasters and events. Huh? Um, I have been leading projects in different countries, uh, and I draw this experience to focus on the sanitation uh, paper that I'll be presenting today. And uh, prior to IDOS, I have been working with the Technical University of Munich and at the University of Bonn. Yes. Let me go, yes. Yeah. Now there is a new concept that has been circulating across the world in, uh, to address sanitation. It is called citywide inclusive sanitation. It's been uh, promoted by the World Bank and the Gates Foundation, Melinda and Gates Foundation, and it is, uh, it's considered to be a significant advancement uh, of, uh, to address the sanitation challenges in urban areas. Uh, this is in contrast to constructing toilets and constructing wastewater treatment plants in many of the global cities in the global south. Well, how, how does it, uh, this concept is significant? Uh, it it's takes into account the full sanitation service chain approach. And second, it embraces a mix of sanitation technologies in contrast to uh, just toilet constructions or a sewer-based sanitation system. Um, and it focuses in contrast to the earlier almost 60, 70 years of interventions by development agencies, it gives importance to formal institutional strengthening. And this is very significant. And in addition to that, it addresses the working conditions of the informal sanitation workers. And the World Bank and the Gates Foundation calls this, in order to implement the citywide inclusive sanitation, it requires a significant change in the mindset of various actors. And they aim to perfect these principles, what we call as the Manila principles, and scale them. And what I call from the theory of mindset is it's called a fixed mindset approach. So you fix certain principles, and then you want to scale it up in different countries through a blanket approach. Uh, so this is called a fixed mindset approach among the theory of uh, mindsets. Now, uh, the tools that the CYs shortly at is, is it called is it uses to strengthen institutions is to enable, empower, ensure financeability to accelerate delivery uh, of government institutions to be more specific. But if you see in most countries in the global south, sanitation is managed or constructed, managed and practiced by informal sector. It's almost like 60 to 70, 80 percent of it. Only those areas where there are wastewater treatment plants and networks that is controlled by the government. Um, and also interesting thing, in many countries, until recently, there are no government departments or ministries that takes lead in sanitation, which means sanitation is a sector that cuts across various departments and various departments takes interest on it. And it has taken this logic of sanitation from the colonial period where uh, cholera and epidemics were uh, growing pandemics that pushed for hygiene in various countries in the global south. And as you see, what is happening in general across various countries is households build the toilet. Um, and women play an important role, especially in Africa. It's the women who maintain the toilets. Uh, not men, not even a male child maintains a toilet. And um, the waste is cleaned from the toilets is by handled by many informal sanitation workers. And they are called either pit uh, workers or truck operators or cleaners. And it is they who clean these sanitation 
in these cities uh, and in the global south, and there is no any assessment of it uh, for uh, as of date. But what is the lessons that we have been learning from various um, uh, countries while implementing the CYs? Uh, we have a very nice paper which has been uh, evaluating some of these. Uh, many cities in the global south are still in the mindset of a sewer-based sanitation system, and they've already taken up policies and legislation in these directions. While governments are willing to take up the challenges of mix of technologies, sanitation technologies, I mean, uh, but uh, there is a dom uh, dominant optic of a sewer-based sanitation system to be promoted in these cities across the global south. And... Uh, Government wants to explore various formal arrangements to control the informal operations. Um, and here, if we want to promote CYs in many of these countries, we need a completely a new set of skills and knowledge and training for the uh, development, uh, the regulatory agencies to handle, especially these informal sectors. And there are a number of cases from Zambia, from South Bra Brazil, from uh, uh, Argentina and so on, where it shows that uh, this is becoming more and more problematic for them to adopt the CYS principles in practice. Um, and the, even the approach by the CYS is to look for a new, up, uh, new approach to look for what kind of regulators they need to have. Are these regulators economic regulators? No, it doesn't work in many of these countries. So what kind of regulators we need to have? Now, CYS is also muddling through various sanitation technologies. As I mentioned to you, though we, they wanted to promote or we wanted to promote a mix of sanitation technologies, there is a dominant, a dominant optic of a sewer-based sanitation system. But is sewer-based sanitation system relevant to the current cities in the global south? And I think in the morning, so in the previous presentation from UK really highlighted some of the challenges of sewer-based sanitation system. And I think he ca captured most of the thing, but some of the thing that I really want to highlight is this. Uh, if you have seen this Fatbergs, have you noticed, or do you, are you aware of Fatbergs? Uh, it is also there in Frankfurt. I have come across few cases in Frankfurt, Fatbergs. But UK is quite nice because it displays these Fatbergs in museum, so you can also go and see it. And fatbergs are something, it is because of the way we live in a current world. We, we consume too much of oil. And this oil goes and deposits in the drainage system and it blocks and it needs to be rectified. And fatbergs and blockages is a very annual occurrence in UK and we have, it's a huge problem. And if you want to see some of the, one of the biggest fatberg in UK, it's in the museum, which is about 250 meters in length and 150 meters in breadth. And it's like a huge building it is there. So you can watch it and... And the other challenge of the sewer-based sanitation system towards, you know, when we start bringing this to the global south is there's a lot of uh, uh, pollutants now which even we are not able to treat it in the developed world. Whether it is AMR, antimicrobial resistant pathogens that we talk about, or even chemicals. We are only talking in terms of researchers, we have been identifying these chemical pathogens, but not in real terms. And even the European Union is struggling to have an uniform regulations on AMR. Uh, so given these challenges, whether a sewer-based sanitation is relevant to an Indian context or a global South context is becoming a big question. Now, if many countries in the global south, cities in the global south, go for sewer-based sanitation system, and you can see this, this is one of the massive drainage system in Mexico City. Um, it is so big that it was constructed uh, at 1.5 million US dollars. It is all on 60 kilometers um, in, at length, and it is such a huge task. And what is happening, going to happen if you're going to promote sewer-based sanitation across the cities in global south? who are almost like 2 billion, 3 billion people, you'll be end ending up uh, constructing number of subsurface structures. And this is just an example of that. And there are a number of studies illustrating that these subsurface sub structures are going to create an urban heat island underneath. 
and this can cause significant impact on the climate change and also a weakness of the structure of the cities. Uh, you might be seeing in many cities in the global south, like China, India, suddenly there are man not manholes, it's not potholes, it's just a huge deep pit. When there is a flood, suddenly one huge deep pit comes and it swallows the whole buildings and so on. And this is just an example of how uh, the underground structures uh, can create such um, uh, threats. And uh, consumption of energy. US consumes almost 3% of the total energy only on wastewater treatment. And if the, imagine if a developing country starts going for a sewer-based system, what is going to happen for the energy consumption? Now, there is a growing, <coughs> yeah, I wanted to show UK, but many of the morning presentations was highlighted about it. Um, but this is very interesting, you know, the legal spill is possible, which um, Simon highlighted that they are allowed to spill now only 10 times in a year if it is a heavy rainfall. But what I want to show is there is increasing transboundary wastewater conflicts taking place and Mexico releases all the waters and US gets affected in the process. And they are all struggling. And this is going to increase if, if we are going to promote sewer-based sanitation system in the global south. What is important is everyone needs toilet, but not everyone needs a flush-based flush sanitation system. You know, that is something, um, sewer-based sanitation is unlikely to succeed in the global south and is increasingly very problematic in the global north too. But they can address it like the way Simon pr presented it. You know, they have the capacity of finance and human resources to address it. But does the global south can handle it or not? It's a big question. Well, what is the solution? There are solutions, I will come back to that. You know, there are diverse sanitation technologies, how that can be promoted and so on. The, uh, uh, well, I want to show this, uh, Tokyo's underground cathedral. I, I don't know whether you have heard about this cathedral or not. It's one of the big underground structure constructed just below Tokyo, yes. If, oh yeah, yes, five minutes. Uh, underground structure just to store floodwaters. Imagine this structure that has been constructed and it can store several space shuttles underneath. Just to give an example. Now, sanitation interventions in the global south or cities in the global south is not a joke. It's very complicated. Because when you talk about sanitation, it is closely linked with housing, drainage, and uh, what not, you know? And what happens is in the global south, the space is highly splintered, unequal, and contested. Why do I say this is we, many cities in the global south still follow the colonial rules of urban planning, the colonial acts, public health acts. And why do I bring this? I don't know, many of you might be traveling to Africa, you can see that, you know, many places are dichotomized. You know, the cities are categorized as Contonement versus other residents. Contonements are areas was historically during the colonial period meant only for the European settlers to protect them from outside interventions, outside threats. But other residents were not considered in the planning process. And that is also an issue. So we still, in many countries, including India, they are still following this colonial planning which tries to promote safe, orderly, clean cities but completely ignores the native land, uh, native settlers, and so on. And what makes that happen is because the planning is only for the land that is tenured, people who have rights on the land. And when people who do not have the rights over the land, it becomes a problem for to implement the urban planning. And if you see, at least in some countries, like in India, it's a bit clear, like tenured and untenured. But in countries like Africa, the tenure is of different nature. Owner occupiers, slum lords, customary land rights. It's very complex to look at the land tenure institutions here. If anyone wants to intervene and in, uh, sanitation in these kind of countries, it's very important to first and foremost to decolonize the space that promotes dichotomy in these kind of cities. Yes, now the shift in mindsets of the development. No, there are so many issues that these cities in the global south are facing. And we are still in the fixed growth mindset, which is 
which operates with more of a command, control, and prescribe approach, and that is leading to further failure of sanitation in many countries in the global south. And um, it's important to move away from uh, this sort of a fixed growth mindset towards a benefit uh, mindset. Benefit mindset is, is a bit different from the fixed growth mindset, which tries to promote uh, all well-being. It is more highly contextualized in its approach. And it promotes decentralization, it promotes participation, and it helps people as stakeholders to do it in a different way. And it doesn't promote a blanket approach that the international agencies wants to promote uh, for sanitation in the global south. Now, what are the alternatives? There are some alternatives being tested out and being implemented in a quite a large way. This community-led total sanitation uh, is one way. I'm not going into detail how it can be operationalized, but there are a number of series of things that has been implemented success stories. But what is significant about this community-led total sanitation is it promotes simplicity, it promotes adaptability and flexibility of local context towards promoting sanitation in the global south. Um, yes, and there are good opportunities to expand this CLTS to achieve SDGs in many countries of the global south. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much for challenging many assumptions that perhaps we have about the solutions to climate change. The, uh, the final presentation is from Kenya, and I'm uh, delighted to welcome Dr. Bansi Buramati, who's going to explain to us how solar-powered irrigation and rainwater harvesting is being developed over there to address the needs of the population. Hello. I everyone. think, Bansi, we just have to get the sound sorted. Yeah. Oh. Am yeah. I audible? Yes. Yes, we can hear. And uh, I think if we can put her presentation up as well now. Yeah, my presentation will be beamed from there. It has failed to upload from my site. It's half arrived. And now you can see. Oh, it's. Yeah. Have we got half of the presentation here or have we got the whole presentation? Yeah, yeah, there. There we go. Uh, let Thank me you. There. Let me say my presentation actually covers Africa. It has examples from Kenya, but I thought uh, I didn't see a full African look and uh, I prepared for Africa. So it is solar power and irrigation systems, rainwater harvesting, and what innovations we are doing for climate change and adaptation in Africa. Go next. Next. Uh, well, I, I, give, I give a small overview of the water availability and or lack of it in Africa. In general, Africa has a lot of water, but unfortunately it's in the wrong, not in the right places at the right time and in the right, uh, like we have the whole of Sarahara, we have Karahari, we have Namibia Desert. So it is spread too much in the, uh, some places and too little in others. At the same time, uh, we have um, several lakes, like at least one sixteen greater than, uh, 27 square kilometers. We also have a uh, high uh, potential for hydropower, and we have a lot of groundwater. So in, in short, the water that is in Africa, were it to be shared equitably, can be enough and is enough. Go next. Next. Uh, at the same time now, these are the challenges uh, we have. As you can see, the more red you are seeing, the, the less there is rainfall. So 65% of Africa's land area is actually dry lands, meaning rainfall is less than enough for crop production. Therefore, irrigation will be needed. Therefore, solar power may be needed. Water harvesting may be needed. The rainfall is erratic. Droughts come, floods come. All the wrong things happen. Evaporation, uh, potential evapotranspiration or evaporation is very high. In dry areas, it can be 10 times annual rainfall. Then we, I mentioned about one distribution of rainfall. And then uh, some 49 countries in Africa have recorded increased disasters. This is due to climate change, droughts, and floods, especially in the recent past. Sub-Saharan Africa itself, uh, water availability has been declining uh, because water availability is a function of total available water divided by population with as population grows. Next. Next uh, slide. Hello. Um, um, the groundwater resources, when you get this 
presentation, you can zoom in and see which country has more than which. But actually, it is the most, uh, there is enough groundwater. Only again, like service water, it is in localized places, but it has been very poorly developed. Next. Uh, the irrigation capacity uh, is another underdeveloped sector. Of the land which we could irrigate, we have only managed to do 6%, and that's at Africa level, of which, if you compare with uh, Latin America, 14%, or Asia, that's 7%. So two-thirds of Sub-Saharan Africa, land is found, of this, most of this irrigation is in Madagascar, South Africa, and Sudan. So if we in deduct those, you find that the contribution of the other countries is very low, and maybe that's Sub-Saharan Africa, including excluding Egypt. So uh, the average area equipped for irrigation is just 1.5%. And then uh, potential to increase irrigation is high, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. And therefore, right now, these days, we are focusing more on small-scale irrigation, and because that's where the majority of the agriculture is happening. Can we have the next one? This is um, a map that compares uh, irrigated area in Africa vis-a-vis -vis the world. I don't have to say much. You can see the last tiniest one at the end for sub-Saharan Africa. We don't compare very well, so we have a lot of work to do. Let's go next. And also we import a lot of money worth of food. Next. Wait, next slide. Next slide. Oh, is it hanging? Next, okay. Uh, if you can see that slide, it shows the disconnect between water availability and its lack. That Africa is getting warmer. We have, these days between 0 0.1 and 1, 1 degree has already happened. Most of the weather increases, the higher temperatures have been recorded in the last two decades. Uh, Climate-related disasters are on the increase, and we have statistics to show that they were 85 in the 90s. And between now, 2000 and recently, we have had more than 500. So you can see uh, climate change impacts are very strong in Africa. From 1970, climate hazards in Africa caused the death of over 730 people, and a lot of them usually drown in floods, by the way. And then uh, climate uh, disasters had an economic loss of 38.5 billion US dollars. So we are bearing the brunt of climate change, yet Africa is not producing so much uh, greenhouse gases. Go on. This is a nice example. I, I picked, which I like to show about Kilimanjaro, is the second highest mountain after Everest. Uh, 1912, those who were going there, the ice caps were that big, as you can see in the top photo. They actually, the, the photo on the right, I'm the one who took it on one day I was flying to Dar es Salaam. So it even looks worse than this, uh, the, the, the artist impression of 2002. So, and right now, like during the dry season, that mountain is almost bare. So impacts are not, we are seeing them in real life. Go on, of climate change. Uh, more impacts, again, now I move more into diagrams rather than maps of uh, crop failures. This is last year in Kenya, dry rivers. Livestock lacking water, dying, and all that, and even flooding like has just happened like two weeks ago. Go ahead. Now we move my topics were three. Uh, one was uh, solar, one was rainwater harvesting. So I've already captured the first part. So now I'm rainwater harvesting. Uh, I'm going just to show mostly photographs of what we do as innovations here. Uh, most of them are meant for smallholder innovations, so what poorer people can afford to do and can do. So you have rainwater harvesting, water conservation, irrigation interventions, and water for multiple uses. Let's go on. Let's go on. Uh, for domestic water, we these are solutions for the top one is, of course, a uh, borehole. The one which looks like a shop actually is uh, what we call them water kiosk. So you, you supply water, piped water or rainwater harvesting, but people pay 
using these modern methods of microchip in certain and they pay through M-Pesa. It's a long story. Uh, and also good old traditional water harvesting from tanks. So for drinking water interventions, I, I think we can start with those two. Then we go on. These are interventions more or less for irrigation. Uh, those tanks are not enough to do much irrigation. So for irrigation on small scale farm, again, not on large scale farm, we have various types and designs of water pans. We call them pans or farm pods. And they, they range from open ones to covered ones, like you can see these people who are constructing them. These kind of pans became popular when uh, UV resistant uh, geomembrane or coverings became available such that people now can collect service runoff and put it somewhere without seepage, anywhere they want. Let's go on. Next one. Another different one, where the um, ground allows, here and there, you can do uh, unlined pans, like the one you see on your left top. You can also take uh, valley, valley bottoms and do a small weir, like you can see. And then also the, the, the diagram at the bottom, I put uh, an artist or um, a drawing, because subsurface dams, to me, are the answer, rather than sand dams. But subsurface dams, once finished, you can't see them. They are under the soil. So the best way to show how it looks like is to show in a diagram like so. Let's go on. Other types of water harvesting also, and various types of tanks and cisterns, from service tanks to geomembrane tanks to covered tanks, shapes, spherical shapes, rectangular shapes. And even the one you see at the bottom has fish. And, and since it has fish, it has to be covered so that the fish are not eaten by the birds, and also for security and to reduce evaporation. So literally, all these other structures you are seeing, my favorite is the one at the bottom, which is a real case uh, study in Baringo in Kenya. The tank is big, it, it gets half an acre or 0 0.2 of a hectare. It's covered, so it's safe for, for security. And it, it has a, a pump, a solar pump, bringing the water from there to the farm. Let's go. Next. Uh, other than water, which is stored and later used for irrigation, there are also all these other technologies like conservation agriculture, where you do reaping, what you call reaping, like what you are seeing those people doing. They dig deep just where they grow the crop, saves the labor, increases infiltration. Or in ridgelands, you do what you call budded basins. Uh, this is a very degraded land. So actually, the top photo is in Zambia, the lower one is in Ethiopia. Uh, they were re rehabilitating a very degraded land where nothing is germinating. But once you dig these budded basins, they hold water and the seeds that come running in, and in, within a year, the land rehabilitates. Let's go on. Uh, so irrigation uh, uh, technologies come in many shapes and sizes. So, uh, what I want you to draw your attention to is good old rice grown in paddies. We have introduced wetting and drying and system of rice intensification, reducing the water used in the rice by over 50%, converting uh, as much as we can. A lot of smallholders are now doing drip irrigation uh, away from sprinkler. And also, they are in the market now what we call smart pumps, like the one being held over there. That is a very, is actually a more powerful pump than many large pumps, and they are quite affordable. They go very well with the solar power because they don't re require a lot of energy to turn. Let's go on. And then there is always something about uh, ecosystem conservation and uh, rehabilitation of uh, degraded lands, and we have so many technologies in gully control and protection. Go on. Go on. Finally, I think to, to depart from water harvesting, we recommend water harvesting for multiple purposes. It's something you have to see in my country to understand. You have a, a water pan or a dam, and people are very rural. They may not have, they carry water home. So to make life easy for them, you have to provide a watering trough for the livestock. You also provide drinking water area, and you even provide what you call a washing dobe. They come with their clothes, they wash their clothes, 
what you are not even seeing there is uh, we even go ahead and add bathrooms and toilets so that they come they take a bath and then uh, they, they, that way they you you lessen the burden on women on fetching water go ahead so the solar power derivation systems uh what i can say go ahead is that i would say we are not there we are starting to get started uh why uh it is uh, a sector that is quite poorly developed yet we have a lot of sunshine i would say being having been around long ago for, for quite some time the earlier technologies of 2019 90s dis disappointed people they were very expensive they always came in a battery they usually broke down so the fact that solar has come of age in the last 10 years or so most people still don't know and you get a lot of skeptics when you want to introduce solar power irrigation to farmers who have let's say slightly medium to, to large farms because they believe uh, it will be a waste of money so we have come from a long way of failures we are not afraid of failures because we learn from failures from dysfunctional gen sets to community programs where farmers are supposed to contribute money for fuel they don't then they abandon to to manual yeah so that first slide is showing the problem statement let's go ahead then here we are now with the solar power delegation here and there uh what you are seeing here is a community somewhere in isilo in kenya and below another farmer in machakos in kenya also whereby we call this kind of irrigation in another language those who are from irrigation sector farmland irrigation development farmers are not in a large irrigation scheme funded by big organization or ngos but they literally use their own ingenuity to bring water to themselves so they can be in small groups like the group above which is from isilo or they can be an individual or a farmer sometimes uh, when uh, on the left i'm sure you are seeing a quite a good solar panel with a lunch tank and everything this is a project supported by one food program so we are, yes with we, we support from various partners again we are seeing solar starting to make up an entry because solar can be expensive especially if you see the infrastructure on your light let's go next we also have medium scale uh, commercial farmers these ones some of them can afford to do hybrid i know you are not seeing a solar panel but for this time i, I chose to show the unit where this man has a controller he can switch from diesel to petrol to sorry from petrol to high, uh, grid electricity and to solar uh, so that uh, he can do much larger work to me a hybrid system is still better than nothing let's go ahead now finally uh, the question i always get is is uh, where in kenya or where have you seen uh, let's say kenya i'm sure in egypt and other places they are there but where in kenya can you see a land scale solar power and irrigation scheme and i i show this uh, slide because this is quite a land scale area and it's pumping from a borehole you can see the solar panels and then they put the water in a, what people like to call a lagoon or a water pan then they irrigate it data a whole scheme of 60 hectares with over 200 farmers all supported by solar so this is solar is doable across scale from individual to small group from medium to large even with the deep wells like boreholes which require a lot of energy it has been done so we can go ahead let's go ahead uh now there's a lot of writing is here um, may I quickly just summarize, and I, when you get this, you can read it slowly, that we need to know who, when you are engaging a solar power and you want to move ahead with the solar power. At the moment, at least in my country, Kenya, it's very much in the hands of private sector. Uh, government playing a very minor role because you need uh, users who are private sector farmers. Suppliers tend to be private sector. Marketing, training policy and then consumers and as well as financiers so it's not it's quite in order for the private sector to lead uh, we know when private sector leads they lead by market uh, market push and whatever but the problem sometimes is that the poorer people get left behind yeah so let's go to the next if I'm, my time is over 
I will not spend a lot of time now. Uh, as much solar pumping kit, this found in Makueni in Kenya, where by either you can have of switching, solar. It's like people are in very remote places, or one which is operating from a mobile phone, and we're having those being done in Kenya. This particular one is in Makueni. Let's go ahead. Uh, again, you can have innovations in financing. I can, given time, I can explain this more. Um, but uh, you can also Google something we call pay as you grow or pay as you go, whereby people who are poor are supported through financial institutions to own solar power and irrigation kit. And the, whatever they are growing pays for it as they go along. So they don't start with much money and they are able to grow, sell their, their whatever, because they pay very little money per day and then they are able to get a loan and move on. Go ahead. Next one. Uh, this is the second to last. The drivers of uh, solar power and irrigation growth, we see this to be first and foremost. We need these farmers to know it nowadays works. It no longer pays it the way it used to do. It's no longer as expensive as it needs to do. So there's a, a lot of lack of information. Manuel here knows we did a baseline in Kenya, in Wasonyiro. We sampled 150 farmers, only three. And even those three were not having a full kit and an idea of what is a solar power derivation. Yet these are very well and informed farmers, uh, many of them educated. So, so there, there's a, a lot of work in capacity building and awareness creation. Then uh, it takes advantage of enterprise opportunity. Uh, we, we work with farmers who are in enterprising. We find that uh, it is relative, well educated farmers are more respective. We see quick returns when you use pay as you go, uh, the one I was mentioning before. Funding from uh, emerging sources should be sought. And then we need oh, always uh, solar power goes well with something else, like irrigation, like water harvesting, like greenhouse, like groundwater, so that uh, it's bundled together. And then the approaches engage a farmer as an investor. We, we go to that farm, not expecting a farmer who is used to handle it, but a pharmacist as, as an investor. So that's why we talk loans. We don't talk uh, handouts. Go ahead. I think that's the last one now. Uh, this is an illustration of the same drivers. You can go ahead. So the lessons learned. Uh, why am I having lessons learned? This is because I have now I'm on my third study on solar power and irrigation in both Kenya and in Africa. The first time I did in 2018, another one I did in 2019, uh, and actually 2021 now, this is my fourth one. So there are a lot of lessons learned so far that uh, uh, solar power and irrigation is mostly private sector land. Therefore, for us to move ahead, you go wherever the people who are selling it, the people who are buying it, it's very private sector led. Then again, it responds to challenges which are there. Uh, I tell my people, we have finished the river water. The water that's left must be pumped, either from ponds, lakes, or from ground. So again, it is it is meeting a need whereby if you find farmers uh, who, are, who are even used to gravity flow, have to now pump water. Then uh, the adoption tends to spread laterally. It is very easy to do unto many. It's very easy. You call a few day, you invite people who are selling solar gadgets, you have one uh, one or two who are using, and in a very short time you can have uh, a good spread. We have seen that happen. Extension services don't exist. You know extension services in Africa are government-led because this is science, this is uh, electrical engineering, Okay, this is hydrology. So that, that space has been taken by marketers and middlemen and what are they called? These people who sell things, salesmen. So again, salesmen can sometimes push what's not right for the farmer to make a profit. And there is where the danger is. Uh, that's why sometimes you find skeptical farmers because they have been pushed by middlemen to buy uh taking on that with their security their condition so we as scientists we come in then uh in africa and so in kenya too we haven't even mapped anything we have no idea who's doing what or where we don't know where we should go next so i would really wish we could do some mapping at least in a country or in the whole of africa of where is the demand 
who is the demand and where is the market. Then the push for SPS will have to be bundled. That's what I said earlier. The cost of developing water harvesting is actually higher. Uh, for, for me, I can tell you, at least in Kenya, uh, the water harvesting, even digging a borehole is more expensive than adding the solar. So, solar is always an add-on. So again, uh, it's expensive. We need help in that side because uh, now I can't work quickly in numbers in my head, but I'm telling you it's beyond a simple farmer's afford to afford. Then the policy push for SPS is no unknown. We need even to educate our so-called policymakers. The science of it, oh, so and so heat field, we, why it field one, another one is working and so on. Then the, the lack of awareness among those who would be users and those who would be funding and those who would be making money. This is a, a sector that should make everyone rich while you're at it. Thank you. I think that's the end. Let me see the last one. Oh, no. Oh, I had a message to investors. I thought I had it. <laughs> okay, the same message to investors. Let me just read the black parts. Now, the farmer gains new knowledge and has to be an investor. When you come, come seeking an investor. That uh, the current uh, scenario is purely private sector, but we need to drag in policymakers so that we get the, uh, the right policies. A good example, in my country, solar, renewable energy equipment are zero written for import and all that, but drip irrigation is not. Not drip, all irrigation farms. What? The, you all pay very, very heavy taxes for pumps, for what? So what's the use if pumps are going to be so expensive? If our policymakers were more sensitive, maybe these things could be more affordable. Then uh, the other thing is that uh, SPSI's government policy gets informed by private in initiatives. Again, uh, we need informal partnerships between tech companies, MFI, M M microfinance, pharma institutions, and so on. We need a higher mobile we have in kenya high mobile penetration and therefore we are easy it's very easy for us to plug the knowledge gap through uh, mobile pushed apps and so on including mobile payments for whatever we want to push as a technology then uh SS, SS, sps is said to be the next big uh, thing revolutionizing food production and bring groundwater and water storage and let's also add that once you give a farmer solar, you have also given them energy. So they, they are able to do value chain inundation, they're able to watch TV, they're able to do many other things uh, without paying a bill for it. So it's a win-win technology for the home and for the farm. Uh, we being groundwater, and I've said, do something about the high cost of constructing water harvesting. Uh, why should dam liners be so expensive? Drilling bowl was so expensive, so we need to have that so that we bridge that technology gap. If I'm not wrong, that's now my last slide. Can you see the final one? But I don't, yeah. So thank you. That's uh, Kakuma Refugee Camp in Kenya, where they also do so solar power and irrigation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it sort of sums up the fact that there's so much going on in so many places that we are not actually aware of that are, and that I, I think what we just heard about the issues of trying to get this uh, solar power accepted in Africa is just the same as all the other things we've talked about today that we've been trying to accept. We have um, 10 minutes for some questions, so if I'd, I'd like to ask our two speakers who spoke earlier to go to the front. And uh, we can be joined by our online speaker as well. Um, do we have a question concerning Africa or India that we can issue to our panel? We have the first one over here. Yeah, my question is in the direction of uh, cooperation between, let's say, countries which are not very friendly with each other, for example, I would uh, li like uh, to mention Bangladesh and India. Bangladesh is really, um, let's say, endangered to be flooded. Is there any cooperation between these countries or things, thinking of doing so? Because um, uh, currently we had uh, the earthquake in Turkey and uh, the Greek helped. So it improved the relationship. Is there any improvement in Africa and India? 
cross cross country be because we heard we we have no boundaries with this problem. Who would like to start, Ashvini? As far as I know, uh, there are uh, cross boundary relations on research levels that we have uh, in European countries also. And uh, yeah, there are, there are countries which are helping, funding, resourcing other uh, developing countries. Like I was talking about the uh, solar uh, project that was funded by the French Association. So yes, we are in a way bonded through other countries to work together in at least at the uh, places where calamities come into picture. Um, Bansi, did you want to answer for Africa? Mm, Africa, we, we have transboundary water issues, but I think our problem is under development of, of resources. Uh, however, there is the famous, you know, the famous Nile Treaty, <laughs> which preempt, it prevents uh, Nile countries, you know, up, up, upstream from developing their water. Uh, yeah, so something like that. But I think the Nile Basin Initiative has been working at that. Otherwise, uh, I don't think we have much transboundary water issues here in Africa. I was wondering, uh, Manuel, whether you have any observations on this? Um, yes, what Ben said, I think it's it's right. So the in the transboundary issues, it difficult for cooperation but here it's also an, uh, the IWA conference in Gigali so there's the African Water and Sanit Sanitation Association which is also then connecting the different countries to work on together to build up um, different solutions and it's in the pro process of um, of development but I also did not feel or um, encountered any big issues between countries here. It was more like we can learn from each other. Congo and Rwanda, they had the same flood this January. So and they here were also then talks about how the Congo can learn from the approaches Rwanda did. So I think they are on a, a smaller level also a lot of things going on. Thank you. And yes, uh, Saravan, do you want to? Sp it should work if you just hold it. Okay, um, on the question of uh, transboundary water issues, uh, India and Bangladesh, India and Nepal has hundreds of years of experience on transboundary water issues. And if you see South Asia, India and Pakistan, all these countries have a very good uh, uh, track record of uh, sharing water. When I say track record, there is a conflicts, but at the same time there are peace. Um, just to give an example for Bangladesh, it's indo Faraka Barrage Act. Uh, we have it for almost 400 years now. And um, India has been behaving as a big brother in that region. So in a way, uh, that is how situation is in, in South Asia. That is the cultural dimensions of it. And India and Pakistan have been, though there is a political conflict, but in terms of water, they are very peaceful. Uh, what makes it peaceful is that the, the river basin of Indus itself <coughs> is very clearly demarcated. Mm. So the conflicts is not much with that. Yeah. So that is, and in case of uh, sanitation related issues, I basically talked about how development interventions yeah. uh, from the international agencies has to operate, you know, not with a command control and prescribed sort of an approach. You know, make it more decentralized, more make it more contextualized, try to understand that and don't go with an optic of a sewer-based sanitation system. Yeah. Thanks very much. I mean, that is slightly optimistic because when you hear people talking about climate change, one of the things we're warned about, apart from the obvious and the fact that it's going to affect agriculture, let's say, in the ag people talk about water wars. There's a lot of talk about water wars, but I think what we've just heard here is actually there is a certain amount of uh, collaboration. It is something we have to be aware of. Um, do we have another question? One from Simon. I really like the concept of citywide inclusive sanitation. Uh, I've never heard of it before, but 
I really, really like that. Do you think that community-based approaches entrench colonial inequalities in cities? That would be my concern. Mm. I didn't, uh, can you repeat that question or explain it? I, I like the idea of a city-wide yes. inclusive approach. Mm -hmm. So every part of the city, I presume, has a similar level of ambition in terms of sanitation. Mm -hmm. Do sort of community-based approaches go against that in that some communities have more capacity to get a better sanitation system? That would be my concern. Yes, if you see in cities in many of uh, like Kenya, Nairobi, or in Nakuru, or in India, Indian cities, there's a wide difference. Like um, uh, posh apartments, rich places, uh, apartments have their own in situ wastewater treatment plant and then recycling. They also have rainwater harvesting system within that apartment complex. But that doesn't exist among the poor communities or informal sectors. Yes, these differences do exist in cities of global south. Now the challenge is, is how to make it inclusive. So that is a challenge. The concept of city-wise inclusive is a very nice concept, but how do we operationalize it is a challenge given the changes, not only about climate change, but the complexities that is existing in that. And when you say community-centered approach, does bring politics, no doubt about it. It's politics is part of the human behavior. Uh, but how do we regulate and manage this? It's a challenge. So that is the role where the government has to come. And even we, uh, we have been talking about how to facilitate this process is more important than how to regulate the process. Little difference in that, yeah, thank you. Um, do we have a final question? Right, I'm going to ask um, Bert Bossler, Professor Bossler, who's the topic leader for citizen infrastructure of the JRF, uh, just to finish up with a few observations on what he has heard this afternoon. As I think, Bert, you're one of those who needs to implement uh, what has been discussed today for JRF. Yeah, thank you, Ian. And uh, also many thanks to you to attend this conference. Uh, many thanks to the speakers for the nice presentations and uh, also to the moderators. And uh, first of all, of course, uh, to the JRF uh, for having organized this uh, conference. Thanks a lot. Yeah, topic leader, cities and infrastructure. It's a quite wide topic, I have to say. So, uh, but there's also a lot of competence within JRF uh, to deal with this topic. And uh, it was very interesting for me to, uh, to follow the presentations. I have to say uh, water is uh, one of them. Yeah, on the one hand, major infrastructures within urban areas, within the cities, but, but it's also uh, f yeah, a large impact on infrastructures with regard to climate change, and we have to adapt it to be resilient against these uh, impacts from water, from flooding, for example. So uh, I think that became very clear here from the, um, from the presentations. And uh, so water is one of the infrastructure areas in a city, uh, I think has a really a major role next to energy, transport, telecommunication, Perfect. of course, there are Thank also you. other infrastructures which are quite important. Yeah, with regard to the to the UK, that was the UK com Commonwealth, uh, North Rhine Westphalia, that was, uh, yeah, the, the headline of this, uh, um, uh, this event, uh, I would say I learned here, uh, with regard to Brexit, I learned uh, nothing has happened, so because we are still in one research area, uh, even the standards, the European standards, are still uh, implemented in the UK. Uh, but uh, maybe what we can learn is, uh, as we now have the UK as a speed example for how to implement things, that's what I've learned, yeah, is maybe also how to accelerate the processes within the, within the EU. I think that could be a good example. Maybe, maybe it was a, a also a, a good case for us yeah, to, to have now the UK as a speed example for how to implement things and uh, to find pragmatic solutions. I always like the UK uh, and uh, how the British uh, do it, uh, uh, to, to find pragmatic solutions. Here in Germany, we often, uh, uh, we, we know how to uh, develop regulations very well, yeah, but how to implement things in a pragmatic uh, way, I think we can uh, learn a lot from the UK. 
Um, and I've learned uh, don't call it taxes, yeah, even if it's uh, if, even if uh, the need for money behaves like a tax, but if it should be called charges, yeah, I will take this as a as a reminder for uh, future discussions. And uh, that uh, North from Westphalia and um, yeah, Germany, India, Africa, you could say uh, with regard to water, it's all over the planet, it's the same issues. And uh, it's not so much about nations, it's more about uh, catchment areas, yeah, so uh, I, th I think from the presentations here from India, it uh, was quite clear, yeah, the whole Indian peninsula was divided into catchment areas and not into sub-nations, so uh, I think it's, that's quite important and uh, something I will um, take with me. Um, yeah, what else? Um, certainly um, looking forward, uh, I, th I see this also as a starting point with regard to the topic infrastructure and uh, cities, uh, in, within JRF, because uh, water is a very important factor, but uh, I, we have already seen uh, from the presentations uh, of uh, four JRF institutes here, was IKT, was IDAS, FIW, IDA, uh, WW, so it was quite, uh, yeah, were quite interesting presentations, and I think it's a very good starting point um, to also include further uh, institutes, yeah, we are not just four institutes, the JRF in total are 16, right, 16 at the moment, yeah, still growing, so, but 16 institutes, so uh, there's a lot of competence also with regard to other infrastructure and city uh, topics, so not only water, but also energy, telecommunication, transport, so we can do a lot on all these topics too, so I'm looking forward to maybe further events, also organized by the JRF and supported by the JRF, so uh, yeah, thanks a lot for today, it uh, was really great to have this event here at IKT, and uh, I'm looking forward to further events in the future. Thanks. Um, thank you, so a couple of things to finish off. One is uh, we would like to invite the, uh, the speakers just for a photograph at the back in front of the Made in NRW JRF banner, if you would mind joining us for that. Um, also, there are obviously some uh, refreshments now, and I think one or two people expressed an interest whilst you're here in just having a look at the IKT um, laboratory uh, out the back. And uh, what we will do is, uh, while we're having the um, refreshments now, if anybody is interested in having a little tour, perhaps if they'd like to make themselves known to Herr Vanyek, and then we can organize um, a short walk around for you in uh, 10 or 20 minutes' time. Okay, thank you all.